I call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order that the record show that a quorum of members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code 551. The time is 6 o'clock. All right. Item 1A, invocation and pledge of allegiance. If you will, Mr. Moore. If you're so inclined, would you please bow with me? God of all people in all places at all times, we pause now to center ourselves upon you. We come to this place <clears throat> with different ideas, with different agendas. We know that there are divisions amongst us, but we know that your spirit can dwell in us and bring us together. We pray now your spirit of peace and reconciliation be upon us. Allow us to set aside any differences and let us be united in our goal of serving and educating the children of this district. Guide our hearts and our minds and our actions. Align our will with your will so that all that we do may be to glorify you. In all the ways that we know and acknowledge you, we lift our prayers to you this day. Amen. 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 Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And the pledge to the Texas flag. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and Thank you, Mr. Moore. Yeah. Item two, awards and recognition. 2A, special recognition, uh, Conroe ISD National Merit Scholar Student Award. Dr. No. All right. Our assistant superintendent for secondary education, Mr. Greg Colshin, will present this item. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. No. It is an honor and privilege to stand before you tonight to honor and congratulate a very special group of students. In October of 2018, over 1.6 million juniors and more than 22,000 high schools across the United States took the preliminary SAT, National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test. Based upon their scores on this test, students are identified and honored through the National Merit Scholarship Competition. Tonight, we are recognizing the Conroe ISD seniors who have met the requirements to be named a National Merit Semifinalist. National Merit Semifinalists are the top 1% of Texas high school seniors who have the opportunity to continue in the competition for scholarships. Of the approximately 16,000 semifinalists, about 15,000 will be named as finalists in the spring and be eligible for 8,000 scholarships worth more than $30 million. We're very proud of the students with us tonight for their academic accomplishments. Parents, thank you for being here tonight to celebrate this very special accomplishment and for the support you give to our schools and in working with our children. If you are a parent of a National Merit Semifinalist, please stand and be recognized. Thank you. Students, thank you for your commitment that you have made to learning. The lessons that you have learned that have allowed you to be here tonight will serve you well throughout your life and will provide you with the same type of success you have experienced. It is my pleasure to introduce our coordinator of guidance and counseling, Denise Cipolla, who will introduce our, introduce our national merit semifinalists. Students, please come forward when you are introduced. Olivia Bainey. <laughs> Joshua B. Ronan Burke. Ayush Desai. Silvino Fernandez Rosada. Olivia 
Ignacio Gonzalez. Blake Higdon. Riley Hunt. Swathi Monam. Andrew Miller. Nicole Petit. Evan Reese. Tian Shu. Shama Theokala. Clara Victorio. To all of you, let me just say on behalf of the board, we are extremely uh, grateful uh, that you have made it this far and we wish you well in your future endeavors and all that you do. And just on behalf of the board, we just want to wish you a great congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on. Item 2B, citizen participation. Ms. Goffrey, has anyone registered to address the board? Yes, they have. We have 32 citizens that have signed up to address the board tonight. The next item on the agenda is public comment from those who have registered to address the board in accordance to board policy BED. Everyone is reminded that this portion of the meeting is not appropriate form for bringing complaints for which a resolution is sought. Before complaints can be submitted to the Board of Trustees as an agenda, as an agenda item, they must be addressed by, the fo following, by following the appropriate policies and administrative procedures. Also, please keep in mind that the Board has no obligation, has an obligation to protect uh, the confidentiality of information that could possibly identify a student. The board cannot per permit comments that include student names or any information that might identify a specific school student. This, pro this, prohi this, prohibition, this prohibition does not apply if the person speaking is a student's parent or guardian or is over the age of 18 and speaking on or about himself or herself. If an issue is mentioned that is on tonight's posted agenda, the board would defer its discussion of the issue until the item is reached on the agenda. For any subject that is not on the board's posted agenda, the board cannot deliberate or make a decision, but it can furnish specific factual information or cite existing policy in response to inquiries. Due to the number of citizens that have registered to address the board, each person is limited to no more than three minutes for this presentation, for their presentation. This will allow the board to hear from citizens as well as ensure that the board meeting runs efficiently as there are many important items on the board's agenda that must be considered. Everyone in attendance is reminded to treat all speakers with respect, 
regardless of whether they agree or disagree with the speaker's message. Any person who does not conduct himself, does not conduct him or herself accordingly, will be asked to leave or will be escorted from the room. Ms. Godfrey, please call your first person. Catherine and Todd Lagos. Lucina Smith. As a concerned citizen, I just wanted to let you know that and on August the 13th, I went to the high school girls volleyball game. And while they were warming up, they were playing music in the background that was very inappropriate. I've handed you some handouts to some of the songs that were being played um, and the words that are in those songs. I tried to highlight them so that you could see that um, it's a repeated um, F word, a repeated B word, and a, pre per, um, and, a and continuation of using the N word. And in a society when we're trying to eliminate racism and when we're trying to eliminate um, sexual violence against women with the Me Too movement and everything else that's going on. I was totally flabbergasted that this music was playing at the volleyball game and that the girls were dancing around the floor to this music. I addressed it with, um, I wrote an email to Mr. Hardiman, to Ms. Smith, Mr. Colshan, and Mr. Null. I received an email back from Mr. Hardiman, Ms. Smith, and Ms. Mr. Colshan, and Mr. Colshan did call me, and we did have a conversation on the phone. He said that um, that he would make sure that it never happened again. But um, I know you said that we're not supposed to address things that are being taken care of. But what I didn't realize is that um, Caney Creek is a part of Conroe ISD, and I had an opportunity to be at their game as well on September the third. And all of these songs were playing at that school as well. And I haven't addressed it with them because I didn't know that they were in Conroe ISD. So my concern is that um, even though I don't have children in the school, that we cannot play this type of music if we want our kids to grow up valuing themselves and trying to end racism and misogyny. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel Walker. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Rachel Walker. I am a parent in Conroe ISD School District. I am the engagement specialist for the Woodlands Pride. I am an ally and I am a Christian. The latter is why I feel compelled to speak to you today. In an article published in The Courier on November 11th, Mr. Inman, a parent, husband of a teacher, and a board trustee for Conroe ISD is quoted as saying, it's not like we need to protect LGBTQ. We need to protect conservative Christians. Statistically, Christians in the United States suffer the least persecution of any group. They are the majority. Historically, any majority faces very little danger for simply existing. Christian youth do not have a high rate of suicide or self-harm. However, the statistics about LGBT persons, particularly LGBT youth, tell a different story. We teach our kids that words matter, <clears throat> and you should always do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And yet, we have a board trustee calling an at-risk people group vile. Mr. Inman, your words are dangerous, and doubling down on such hateful rhetoric has shed much needed light on the hate that is being spread in our community. The kind of hate has no place here, and as a parent, I will not stand for it. Our kids don't need protecting from drag queens. Our kids need protecting from such hateful and bigoted speaking. The Woodlands Pride was asked to speak about our festival on local TV during the Oak Ridge Homecoming game. That invitation was then withdrawn because some felt it would be too political to have us speak at the festival. And yet, here is a well-known member of the community openly inciting hate from other parents based on his politics. I was standing on that field during homecoming to watch my daughter and her drill team. I got to witness an openly gay kid get crowned homecoming queen. 
I listened to her peers who voted her in that title cheer wildly for her as she was crowned. <clears throat> Our kids are leading the way in what it means to be kind and inclusive. It's us parents that need a refresher. Mr. Inman, you said that Kevin Brady is praying for you. Well, I am too. I'm praying that God would break your heart for what breaks his, that God would give you eyes to see his children as he does. They are his beloveds. They are not vile, and calling them as such surely breaks his heart. Any time an LGBT kid thinks, thinks that God doesn't love them because of something said in his name, it breaks his heart. Mr. Inman, you are not the victim here. No one wishes you any harm. We are simply asking that you refrain from doing any more harm with your words. The only way I see to move forward and effect positive change is for you to issue a public apology and resign. If you refuse to do either or both of those, then I look forward to seeing you on the campaign trail in 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anne Marie Kennedy. Anne Marie Kennedy. I'm Anne Marie Kennedy, and I have a daughter in Conroe ISD. I'm here to share with you, the board and the community, my grievous concerns about the lack of professional boundaries, which have been exhibited on a regular basis by um, Dale Inman, a minister in the community and a school board member. I witness a lack of intellectual integrity when Mr. Inman conflates the vocation of a drag queen and performing artists with sexual predators and has, in, has slurred the entire LGBT communities all at the same time. I'm an RN. I must abide by professional boundaries. I must also provide care with unconditional positive regard and support for the inherent worth and dignity of everyone. This is my faith tradition and my professional boundaries and responsibilities are, are there together me take care of a white supremacist requires care I have a black daughter yes I have to provide their care and they get good care murderers I've taken care of them too and they get good care I have not compromised my faith nor have I compromised my license nor their health um, because I was a prison nurse, sorry. Um, that would clear that up. Um, <laughs> Mr. Inman practices a faith he has repeatedly used in a public and secular organization and has been using this as um, a justification to vilify an entire community of law-abiding and upstanding people and using this clearly um, as to say and portray himself as better than anyone else. And he projected that only the Christian students have this value in the communities and schools. Details notwithstanding, Mr. Inman is barred from the classroom because of his lack of boundaries with young girls. We are all aware of teachers and preachers and coaches and police using their power imbalance to abuse, rape, molest, and otherwise intimidate students. We need to be on guard. All students must be welcome and feel welcome in order to thrive. Please understand that no one is trying to make your straight kids gay. It doesn't work that way. Um, but we are trying to keep your GLBT kids alive. Houston is officially ground zero for human trafficking and sex trafficking. So please, impl I implore you to keep track of your kids and always love them and always make sure that their home is a safe place to be. GLBT kids are at higher risk of being trafficked when they either run away or are kicked out of their homes because they do not believe that their friends' parents will let them in. And I see my time is out. And thank you. Thank, thank you. you. To protect 6,000 Mary Harrington. Mary Harrington. My name is Mary Harrington. I'm a parent. 
Why aren't we here talking about bus schedules, Conroe's new junior high, or whether we'll have Coke machines in the cafeteria? This is why. This is wasting my tax dollars. These are newspaper articles, interviews, social media transcripts containing numerous examples of Dale Inman's disgraceful public behavior. These public statements contain derogatory, harassing, bullying, discriminatory remarks on a gender-related school issue. The statements are harmful to Conroe ISD, gay, lesbian, bi students, teachers, and parents. The policy of Conroe ISD is that all students be free from bullying, discrimination, and harassment, regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, disability, or religion. My daughter is a student of Conroe High School. Yes. <laughs> She's held to this bullying policy. Mr. Inman is a board member. He's supposed to enforce the bullying and harassment policy, but instead he is the bully. Mr. Inman, you can teach your children they'll go to hell if they're gay. However, you cannot teach my child that. Let me be clear. This is a Conroe School Board meeting. This building's paid for by my tax dollars. This is not your church. In your church, you can preach that homosexuality is a sin. That's your religious freedom. But your religious freedom ends where mine begins. Keep your preaching to Sunday mornings and out of my daughter's classroom. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cecilia, Cecilia Harrington. Zoe Nafshisi. <clears throat> My name is Zoe Nafshisi. I am a student at Cotton Row High School. Um, I'm bisexual. I'll say that. Mr. Inman's words are disgraceful. As Cecilia's mom said, and I just want to make it clear that they hurt. They hurt us. And to call us vile and disgusting and that we're vicious is wrong. It's very wrong. And I just would like to ask you to not make those comments and consider your effects on Connor High students or any students in Connor ISD that are gay, lesbian, bisexual, or trans, or anything else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Marley Poon. Hello, my name is Mary Lee Poon, and I'm a mother of two children who grew up in CISD. I volunteered hundreds of hours in our schools over a 12-year period because I care about our students. I've worked as a teacher and a public health professional. I'm here today because in a very public rant, an adult member of our school board who's elected to ultimately serve students in our district spewed <coughs> explicit hatred hatred in a flagrant example of bullying against part of our district student population. Based on studies, over 10% of high school students identify as LGBTQ. And that was in a survey, and as a public health professional, I can tell you that's low because of underreporting. A large number of our students in CISD are LGBTQ. Homophobia, Stigma and discrimination can negatively affect their health and well-being. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among young people, with LGBTQ youth being four times more likely to seriously consider suicide and to attempt suicide than their peers. They are more likely to experience bullying and homelessness. Bullying puts youth in general at increased risk for depression, suicidal ideation, misuse of drugs and alcohol, and can affect academics. 
for LGBTQ youth, that risk is higher. So considering these facts, listen to the words used by our school board member publicly. The LGBTQ community is one of the most vile, hate-filled communities I've ever come across. These folks are vicious. Let me tell you something. This speech violates students in our schools. If a member of our school board does not agree with a guest that a teacher or principal invites into the classroom, a public rant condemning an entire segment of our student population using discriminatory and hateful and bullying language is not acceptable recourse. In addition to being far from professional, it is hateful, it is discriminatory, and completely inappropriate. We must build a safe environment for all of our youth in all of our schools. Thank you. Chris Hodgins. Good evening. Good evening. Before I begin, you should know that I am not a big fan of public speaking, but tonight I find it necessary. You should also know that I am here representing only myself and not my employer. You see, I am a teacher in Conroe ISD. My name is Chris Hodgins, and I am here this evening to address a bully on our school board, Dale Inman, and to recommend that the board removes him from his position for his incompetence. As a teacher in Conroe, my greatest concern is for our students. The students who see a leader in their district inciting hate and tearing down public education at every turn. A leader who was fired from Willis ISD for inappropriate communication with middle school girls. Last month, Dale Inman was quoted as saying, the LGBTQ is one of the most vile, hate-filled communities that he has ever come across and that he had spent time in the Middle East with radical Muslims. As a Marine myself with two combat tours to Iraq, I can assure you that that is the stupidest statement I have ever heard. <laughs> to make such a claim puts the students in our district in a position where they fear those that are supposed to represent them. For those of you that have never visited Dale Inman's Facebook page, you should know that he attacks public education on a regular basis, claiming that educators are using their positions to spread their liberal agenda. Ironically enough, it seems it is Dale Inman's agenda that we should be questioning. He has begun using my wife, Stephanie Hodgins, the principal of Willis High School, as a scapegoat, which he has been doing for five weeks now. His words are reckless and unhinged meant to create chaos and confusion among those that do not know her. If you're still left wondering what, whether Dale Inman can be trusted, here's another quote from him written just five weeks ago. The anti-America indoctrination of students is taking over in our schools. It has entered Conroe ISD, and we must push back. Multiculturalism is a weakness, not a strength. Those are his words. I ask you this, what is Dale Inman talking about? Is it the LGBTQ community that he is so passionate about excluding, or is it possibly another group that he's going to target next? This reeks of racism and bigotry, and I will not stand for it. Board members are supposed to represent their constituents. Does Dale Inman represent you? Derek Carter. <clears throat> Hi. Um, wow. I'm here to talk about something else tonight. <laughs> um, You're loud. Blessing in disguise. Got a great audience. <laughs> Lots of people will hear me, so I'm thankful for that. Thank you guys for your time. Uh, I prepared for five minutes, so I'll try and... Uh, condense this. Uh, I was going to read my notes, but we'll just, you know, we'll go with that. 
Um, I'm here because uh, my wife and I recently moved to Conroe ISD about a year and a half ago. Um, we were immediately impressed. Uh, we enrolled our two kids uh, in kindergarten and second grade at Bush Elementary. Um, we had been involved in another public school district before that had great schools, but we were blown away uh, by the, the environment that the teachers and administrators created at Bush. Uh, it's, it's a great place. If it's at all representative of what happens in Conroe ISD, uh, we have a great district. Um, <clears throat> but over the next 12 months, we began to see what I think is one of the most important and urgent opportunities for improvement for the district in, in achieving our mission, the stated mission, of achieving our best for the students, achieving the best for our students. Um, and that happened as my, uh, my oldest daughter, uh, Ellie, went through uh, testing for dyslexia and dysgraphia and other special ed uh, education needs. <clears throat> we, uh, we found uh, that in spite of our urgency about it, <laughs> try to condense this part, um, the, the process tended to be slow. As you guys know, when your family faces an issue, nobody has the same level of urgency about it that you do. Um, we expected that, but uh, we found the, um, the delays in testing and the dragging out of the testing uh, to be very frustrating. We, we requested testing um, at the very beginning of the spring semester in January. Um, I guess right at the end of the Jan uh, right at the end of January, uh, it was not completed until a couple of weeks before school was out. We missed an entire semester of of interventions. On top of that, we we had to really push to get them to actually test for dyslexia and dysgraphia. In spite of our our witness to what was happening with her, our work with her, um, my mother in law is a diagnostician, saying there's no doubt she's dyslexic, and even her teacher, who was trained as a dyslexic uh, as a dyslexia teacher. Um, saying this kid's got an issue. Um, we had to push through that process. It seemed there was a reticence, a bias towards inaction um, within the administrators, not, not the teachers, but within the administrators. I don't even know that it was them personally, but just within the system. There seemed to be a bias towards inaction, a bias towards let's not qualify more kids than we need to. Um, we, uh, we finally got her qualified. She started the dyslexia program this this uh, fall. We were very hopeful about that, um, but we soon found out they would only be meeting for 30 minutes a day. Most dyslexia programs recommend an hour a day, four days a week for uh, three years plus. Um, they were going to do 30 minutes a day, and that's if you do one one They were going to do 30 minutes a day, um, four days a week for, uh, with a group of five to six uh, learning difficulty I'm going to have to cut so, you off, right? Yes. Yeah, hey, I apologize. Not thank you, guys. We got to. Um, thank you. Use that uh, HB3 budget for more dyslexia teachers and we'll be in good shape. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Regina Neely. Regina Neely. Hello. I don't have anything prepared. I'm just here as a parent of a student in Conroe High School. And I have to tell you, we were in a district other than Conroe before, and coming here, it's been amazing. The multiculturalism, the equality, the amount of separate out-of-school out groups that these kids can go to, to find their connections is amazing. And I would hate for any elected official to take away any of that awesomeness, because that's what makes Conroe great is that every kid there knows that they are respected as much as any other kid. I mean, you can't learn, you can't go on, there's nothing else above that if you don't feel respected. And so an elected official that makes our students feel that way has to go. You, you're allowed to think that. I'm not here to change hearts and minds. If you wanna think that there's a negative thing about my community, if you wanna look me in the eye and tell me how disgusting I am, then you're free to do so, but you're not free to do so as a paid employee, as an elected official. If you have a freedom of speech, you can tweet anything you want, but not as a representative of us. Well, but he's, not, he's a representative of us. He's allowed to Please do allow anything her to that he speak. wants. Do not interrupt during folks speak. I mean, we allow everybody in our I'm just saying you're free to do speech, it. So let's do that. Just not in the position that you hold. That's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Sam Neely, Sam Neely. Thank 
Evening, folks. Uh, like my mother, I have nothing prepared. Runs in the family, I guess. <laughs> but I'm a student of Conroe High. That's school right across the street over there. And I've been in theater all four years. Now, I don't know what you know about theater, kids, but we are flamboyantly sexual. <laughs> now, I have spent those four years in the arms of the LGBTB uh, community. And honestly, they're a nice group of folk. Of course, there's bad apples in every bunch, but well. Now, I can only assume that it's out of ignorance that you speak of this hatred. And I ask, should the ignorance have any place in our education system? Thank you. Thank you. Nicole May. Nicole May. Um, hi. So everybody knows I'm here to talk about dyslexia, right? <laughs> uh, I'll cut it in half tonight. Um, and I have some light reading for you as well. So um, I'll just get straight to it. These are the things that we're asking for. We would like one dyslexia therapist at each campus. Currently, our dyslexia therapists service multiple campuses. We know we are under-identifying dyslexics by almost a 15% negative margin. In order to get closer to a true identified number, each campus must have at least one dyslexia therapist for the entire day. Number two, we would like to increase the dyslexia services from 30 minutes to 45 minutes. The Reading by Design brochure states 30 to 45 minutes per session, four to five days a week. Currently, CISD offers the minimum, 30 minutes a day, four days a week. The execution of this program is what will literally make or break a student's educational future. We were offering the literal bare minimum for our, our dyslexics. If we increase the dyslexic instru instruction to 45 minutes a day, four days a week, that equates to almost 70 additional hours of dyslexia intervention a school year for our one to five. Not to mention our one to five, one in five will complete the program quicker. Number three, we are asking for smaller groups of students in each dyslexia group. The recommended group size is two to six. Compliance says that we will go up to six in a group. Commitment says that we will have smaller group size for more effectiveness um, in, the, in the program. We, will, we would like to see no more than three in the dyslexia group. Number four, we would like to see our special education teachers to be trained in administering reading by design to our dyslexic special education students. Our dyslexic special education students are our most severe dyslexics and require one-on-one -on -one dyslexia intervention by a qualified dyslexia teacher. Number five, we must do away with the LLI program for dyslexia, dyslexic students in special education. LLI is not an Orton-Gillingham approach to reading. All dyslexia experts agree dyslexics need an Orton-Gillingham-based reading program to learn to read. Um, I, it makes me wonder if uh, maybe the special education team and the dyslexia team don't partner together because there's no reason why we should ever offer a dyslexic student a non orton gillingham approach to reading. Um, number six, we are asking for transparency from CISD as it relates to our dyslexic population. We are asking for specifics regarding short-term strategies to fix the above-mentioned problems and long-term strategies to become a district that is a forerunner to other districts as it relates to its dyslexia population. We would like to hear from the dyslexia department regarding these strategies at a board meeting. Communication is key. At this point, we are only given limited info and only if we ask for it, we need specifics. Number seven, and this is last. Last, our decoding dyslexia state leaders are making a big push to begin leading dyslexia service under IDEA instead of 504. We should begin offering FIEs to all suspected dyslexic students. The FIE is held back as some unattainable test I'm for have our students. To cut you off there. I apologize. Well, Mr. Emmon, you just hijacked this meeting for all of us in <laughs> Conroe. Thank, Thank you. I appreciate it. Amber Fusca. Over a month has gone by since my husband and I came here and pled for an intervention for our son. 35 days, 168 school hours, and nothing has been done to help our child. 
First, let me remind you that according to Texas Education Agency's eligibility criteria for special education, section 29.003 states, a student is eligible to participate in a school's district special education program if the student has one or more of the following disabilities, a physical disability, intellectual or developmental disability, emotional disturbance, learning disability, autism, speech disability, or traumatic brain injury. My child has three of the seven disabilities that I just mentioned, and yet here we are still begging to get our child into special education. The national average for special education is 14%. The state of Texas as a whole is 9.1%, and Conroe ISD comes in at an outlier of 7.8%. From these numbers, one can easily infer that Conroe ISD is neglecting the needs of special education students. When we came to you a month ago, my child had already begun to regress. His situation continues to deteriorate. I have with me 18 of my child's behavior reports. The admin have been called 11 times in 18 days, and my child has been removed from his class. On the times that were reported, the removal has lasted 30 to 45 minutes for each instance. This not only disrupts my child's education, but that of every child in his class. Six days ago, my child had to switch classes because his teacher decided to involve a nine-year-old autistic child in an adult conversation. My husband sent an email to the teacher addressing a concern we had with our child. That teacher decided to ask our child why he shared information with us. <sighs> Instead of responding to the email, our child had no knowledge that we had sent an email, and responding in this fashion can ultimately jeopardize our child's willingness to ever communicate or confide in us again. Not to mention the fact that it triggered a meltdown and is one of the 11 times the admin had to be called to his class. The inability of my child's educators to properly deal with an autistic child in a mainstream classroom is a large contribution to the deterioration of my child's mental health. School has become a stressor where my child spends seven hours a day in constant anxiety. He has lost almost all ability to regulate his emotions. Even at home, where we used to be able to stave off meltdowns, he is now having several a day. Your inaction has put my child at the precipice of irrevocable damage. If we continue down the path you've chosen, I don't know if I will ever be able to get my child to function the way he has in the past. If we continue down this path, I am terrified that my child will be on a suicide watch list in a couple of years. Conroe ISD has clung to policy to the detriment of a child. The worst part is you have either chosen ignorance or wanton disregard of the policies you ad adamantly cite. Idea states section 300.305 gives the requirements for evaluation. Section 2 states the public agency is not required to conduct an assessment unless requires, requested by the child's parents. We have been telling you for the last 60 days that we do not want an assessment, Got and it. still you insist that you one must be done. Off. I apologize. I don't mean to sound rude in any form of I fashion, understand. But I have to cut you off. Thank you. I am going to say, how dare you guys sit here and claim that you care for children. Thank you. But you clearly care for ones that are not special needs. Thank you. Elizabeth Felthouse. Good evening. My name is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Felthouse. I come and speak to y'all as a mother and as a therapist in the community as well as a constituent. Have you ever seen the silent tears of a child that has been bullied? Have you ever seen the cuts on a child's body from desperation to feel anything other than the emotional pain that they are experiencing. GPS signal lost. Awkward. Have you ever seen a child that is suicidal? Have you ever held a mother or a father that has lost their child to suicide? Or whether that be in your thoughts, your prayers, or your arms. As a therapist, I have experienced all of these. I have felt the thickness in the air when there are no magical words to comfort the pain. As a child growing up, I learned the saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I'm here to share that they are hurtful. All of these things are extremely hurtful. There have been concerns regarding agendas recently in the news. We all need grace, whether that's from a higher power or our peers. 
I am a true believer that most people are doing the best that they can with the information that they have. Sure, there are people with bad intentions in every group. If any child is being bullied for their views, we as the adults need to help children learn how to disagree respectfully and not do any more harm. Not everyone is going to like me, not everyone's going to like you, and that's okay, but it's not okay to be hurtful about it. When we have quotes from a school board member in local news that the LGBT community is one of the most vile, hateful communities I've ever come across, and I've spent time in the Middle East, it is heartbreaking. We do not have to agree. We do not have to accept the other's points of views, but we must respect one another. We do not want any child to be judged for their beliefs. I want our schools to be a safe place for all. We need to protect all children from judgment. We need to protect all children from discrimination. We need to protect all children. There's room for everyone. There is no room for bullying. There are subjects that come up in our household that we might not believe in. It is simply explained that that's not how we do things. Some people might not think like we do, but we always work to show love and respect for the way that others do things as long as they are not hurting others. I respectfully ask the board and the community to please make sure that you are doing everything in your power to educate yourselves on others' points of views and experience empathy for their journey, even if it's not their own. I just have one more sentence. Use caution when throwing sticks and stones or words. You may never know where they are, who you are going to hurt, and it might be your own child. Thank you. Daniel Finner. A Muslim imam that stands on their beliefs, an LGBTQ activist that stands on pride, a community organizer that stands on what's matter. All those are accepted with thunderous applause. But a man that stands on his biblical faith is derided and defamed. This action makes your circle of tolerance bent on a curve that is by your opinion. When that happens, there is no truth to your tolerance. It just simply is your opinion. I'm thankful that I've seen people on this board that stand on the truth that was laid on the cross 2,000 years ago for our sake, for our salvation. It has been at times misrepresented. It has been mis at times misunderstood. And it has been at times misinterpreted. But it remains the truth all the same. Many people call themselves Christian and misrepresent the truth because it's, the truth is inconvenient for them to be in the world, even though as a Christian they're commanded to be in it, but not of it. Here, here. Amen. I'm thankful for Dale Inman standing on truth of his faith, truth that is spoken in love, and tr truth is, does not change based on anyone's opinion. Because the truth that it's Dale stands time. for it's his time. is proclaimed by our Creator, and it leads to eternal peace, not peace in the present, eternal peace, eternal freedom, and eternal love. Thank you. Thank you. Kaylee Newell. Kaylee Newell. Hello, my name is Kaylee Newell. And the first thing I would like to start off with is how I want y'all to know how great of a person Mr. Dell Inman is and how great of a father figure that he has been to me. And the Inman family have given me a place to stay when no one else would. They have bought me clothes. They have provided a roof over my head. They have sheltered me, made sure I was safe when no one else would. 
Dell Inman is one of the smartest people I've ever met in my whole life, and I trust him with everything. I trust him with my life. Not once, not once in the whole six years that I've been staying with the Inman family have I ever, ever felt threatened, mistreated, or violated, or anything of that kind. Every time Mr. Dell Inman, before he even walks up the stairs to come talk to us, he yells up the stairs, ladies, are you appropriate? Is it okay for me to come upstairs? And for the people who don't even personally know Mr. Inman, and they're saying these false allegations towards him, should be very, very ashamed of themselves. Because not, not one of these people besides his family and the people that, that he loves and they love him know him how we and my family know him. He, he has coached our soccer teams. He has preached to us. He's, he has sent us on youth trips that I would have never been able to afford myself. And he's just been the greatest and the smartest person that I've ever met. And, it's, and people talk about bullying, but what, anybody can be bullied. You don't have to be gay. You don't have to be black. You don't have to be white. Anybody could be bullied. And it's sad when your administration, a principal, can bully someone that works for them or a student of the person that works for them. When you have, when I have random people that I've never met in my life come up to me and say, a principal of mine was talking about my sister. Yes, my sister. We're not blood, but the, the Inman family is my family. And when a principal that's supposed to guide children and show them the path is talking bad about one of their children, what is that showing us? How is that leading us to a better community? It's not. Thank you, Dell. Thank you, Dad, for everything. Thank you, and for the Emlyn family. John Nix. Good, good morning. I mean, good evening, uh, fellow Conor ISD board members. i got a couple of things I want to talk about. First things first, I'd like to ask for Dr. Knoll to make a public statement on this, on what he feels on this whole topic that we've mainly been talking about tonight regarding a fellow, regarding a fellow uh, board, board member. I've known, I have a friend that recently came out as transgender that came out and told this, told Mr. Edmund that he was trans that she wanted to be called under a new name. He texted back, it was very rudely, and saying about gender confused. And a few days later, he got a text message and a call from his attorney, his attorney that he cannot have no further communication with him and his wife. I don't feel that's acceptable because I live in the state, I live in not just in Conroe ISD, I live in the Conroe feeder zone. I live here in the city. To feel like if a taxpayer came and approached a fellow, any one of y'all, without fear that any sort of anything can happen is wrong. And that's something I want to see addressed. I'm with the, all the others with the pro-LGBT movement. And I feel like I said, I would like to see Curtis Knoll make an official statement and publicly in the media. That's one part one of what I wanted to talk about tonight. Part two, I'm a delivery driver. I do food delivery apps like Uber Eats, Postmates, Instacart, and that sort of stuff. I want to see policy changed to where we can deliver to illegally deliver to Conroe High Schools. I know Tomball High School has a special table set up where students can order on the app and deliver and still it'll be delivered right there. Kids still do it. They break the policy all the time. I've seen it happen. I've seen them leave crazy notes. I've delivered to teachers. I did two deliveries to Conroe, High, Conroe Schools last week. So I'd like to see you address on those two things to really change the policy, especially at Conroe High School and the other Conroe High Schools in this week and address my other concerns. Thank you so much. Thank you. Tom Oliver. Tom Oliver. Good 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. I want to thank all of you for allowing me to be here tonight. Uh, I know sometimes your job must be very thankless and enduring, uh, but I do want to thank you. But I'd like to take just a moment. There's a lady in a pink dress in the back here, and I spoke out when you spoke about Dale being a, a, a paid person. I said he wasn't paid. I apologize for interrupting you. It was wrong of me, and I hope you'll accept my apology. Uh, I do not want to spend a lot of time discussing what's already been brought up. Uh, I don't need to address innuendos, false statements. What I do want to address is somebody that I've known for 20 years, who's been an asset to this community. I've worked with his entire family. I've watched him take other families in that are homeless, that are people that have been uh, lost everything they owned in hurricanes. He's taken them in. I've seen him work with men and women, murderers, drug addicts, you name it. If there's anything in this world that Dale Inman is not, that is a bigot or a racist or a homophobe, <laughs> these statements are based upon innuendos and half-truths. I know this man from the heart. I've watched him hold the brokenhearted and the downtrodden in his arms. I myself can speak to this. I've been at schools and held LBGT, whatever you want to call it, I probably have it wrong, in my arms and talked to them about Jesus Christ and they had no problem with it. In fact, I earned their respect and they said thank you. But it's not because I'm condemning them, I'm sharing with them what I believe the Bible says. Now somewhere along the line, our society has lost its way. I heard something today when we opened this meeting, a prayer. To God. I thank you, gentlemen, for opening this meeting in that manner. Dale Inman, I thank you for the stand that you take. You see, I hear a lot of people say, yeah, yeah, good deal, good job, go ahead, you do it. But where are they today? Where are the people that are standing up for what is right? All right? Somewhere along the line, and we just heard an example of that, we're talking about doing what's wrong because everybody's doing it, and that's okay, and they want you to change the rules to meet that. That's not right. Now is it? What's right is right. Two plus two equals four. You can't change that. And doing wrong is wrong. I don't care what you say. And there's an absolute truth. And whether you want to believe in it or not, that is up to you. But tolerance works both ways. And I have seen some of the most despicable and hateful things I've ever seen aimed at a person on Facebook towards my brother, uh, and I'm going to give you a story. I was with this man side by side. We were in Montgomery County Jail. That's your time. If you'll remember. Sir, your time. That's your time. Okay. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Kelly Enman. I did have some things prepared that I wanted to share with you about uh, my husband, Dale. But as I heard others speak, I felt the need to address these items um, instead because I know my time is limited. Tonight, people have proven one of Dale's comments. Christian students and teachers need to be protected from administrators who promote alternative lifestyles. Christians, please continue to stand up. Please continue to stand for your beliefs. My daughters personally are harassed on a daily basis because they support their father, because they know their father is, is standing on his biblical truths, and because they stand on their biblical truths. They know what the Bible says, and they are not getting any support from the administration when they're being bullied, but rather they are themselves being bullied by that same administration. We have lived Ma'am, the, the lady that talked about holding those kids, I have lived it. I have lived where I've seen my children going through this type of harassment. I have lived where I've seen my children physically beaten up or someone attempt to murder them, and, that, and it's gone to court. I know it firsthand, and that man right there is the best person you can have on this board. There is no bigotry in him. As a matter of fact, some of those people that have been in our house, those people that have been in our house have also been 
of the LBGTQ, whatever that community is. It was a young lady who had an alternative lifestyle. And we did not even consider for one minute, minute about the lifestyle. Our, our choices are based on love and acceptance. And I know that you men back there have seen that in him. And I know that you constituents who voted for him know that's who he is. So those of you that want to cast false allegations, guess what? We, the voters, who almost unanimously voted him in, we know who he is. Frank Warner. My name is Frank. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, sober and recovery from childhood sexual abuse, drugs, alcohol, and tobacco abuse. I've been clean for over 30 years. And I, I feel I need to talk about the fear of the Lord. And all of us here are going to give an account before God for our conduct, our behavior, how we live our lives, how we influence others. And all of us are sinners. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. The free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus said, let the suffer the little children come to me. In the same passage of scripture, he said, there are angels which look over them, watch over them. And he said, it would be better for you to be cast into the sea with a millstone tied around your neck, or that you would never be born than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. And my prayer is for us, Take that into consideration. That applies to all of us whether we believe it or not. Whether we're parents, whether we're children, whether we're adults, it applies to us. And my call is for us to put our faith in Christ and to take into consideration the teachings of his word. And that's all I have to say. Also, when I was being sexually abused, they threatened me. They threatened uh, me with, you know, with a knife, various other things when I was a little kid. And so I just want to let you know that, that, that about being bullied. This is like when I was like very young, six years old, four or five, and stuff. And then one other thing is Jesus knows how to deal with bullies. There was a woman caught in adultery, and she was brought before Jesus. And they said, put her to death. And he said, no, the first one of you without sin casts a stone. And then he looked at her and said, daughter, where's your accusers? And she said, there's none. He said, go and sin no more. I didn't say go continue on what you're doing wrong. He said, go and sin no more. And she stumbled and fell again. He let her get back up and get back in the race. Some of the group called Celebrate Recovery at our church. We have people from all types of backgrounds, <coughs> all types of addictions, sexual addiction, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, gambling addiction. And we provide a resource and a way of escape from the things that have held us captive it hindered our personal growth and development as individuals. And that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Ginger Pilot. Ginger Pilot. So I, I spoke at the, the Willis meeting as well. That was just kind of me thanking the school board for following non-discriminatory laws, for having diversity and inclusion. That's very important. Um, when I look over a lot of the things that have happened on Facebook at that meeting and everything, the only word that comes to mind is that you're a bully. Um, your words are harmful to our children. They hurt my heart for these children. I have a child that is part of this community that you don't like. These are not made up accusations. These are words you have spoken. You believe them with all of your heart. It is not like we need to protect LGBTQ. We need to protect conservative Christians. The LGBT community is one of the most vile, hate-filled communities I've ever come across. 
So you may have come across a few bad folks. There's bad folks in every, every area. Um, every religion, every race, there are bad people out there. Our youth need to be protected from you, from your words within the school. As it was spoken before, do what you want to do within your church. That's your place to speak those kind of words, not at a school. If you want to speak those words at a school, pay for private school, not in a public school. You have put down a whole community. You put us all, all of them in one bucket and look down upon them. A leader should work to lift others to be an example. You don't have to agree with everything. We are all different. We have our freedoms, but you should be able to show kindness. I was told when I shared um, on World Kindness Day on Facebook, you know, that I had hoped all children would keep kindness in their heart and share it with all, all. And I was told what I meant was that I was calling for all Christians co to condone sin and that my intent is to share that if someone disagrees with me that they are unkind and unloving. I never spoke those words, okay? I find often with extremists that they have to manipulate words to suit their own needs. Some of the horrible things that you've said, the children have heard, one of them came up and spoke. Okay, that's just one of many. I would definitely like to see you resign and have no part of the school system. You fail to understand the impact of your words on our youth. And Christianity is not the only religion. So you're, again, just keeping it to one group. Your, your words hurt, Mr. Inman. They can cause so many bad things. As a leader, you should support and help and be kind. Thank you. Dale Fessender, Fessenden. Thank you for this opportunity to address you. Um, I am again speaking on the topic that has been most spoken on this evening. As a father of seven uh, grandchildren, 23, live in the Conroe ISD, pay taxes on two properties in Conroe ISD, have some of the grandchildren attending, all of, the, all of the children are older. So some of the grandchildren are attending Conroe ISD. I am very thankful for the Conroe ISD reputation. Uh, I know you all have worked hard. I know that uh, Dr. Noel has worked hard, and I appreciate that. It, it is a good reputation. What I want to do tonight is to, first of all, comment that many of the speakers tonight have talked about the children. Um, I won't claim that I have read everything in the newspaper about what's been said about the situation. But of the things I have read, I've not read anything where Mr. Inman said anything about any of the children. His comments were directed about teachers and administrators, not children. So uh, they were not his target. And the other thing I would want to make sure that you understand is that uh, some of the things I've wanted to mention, I do think a um, public statement would be uh, appropriate. And I want to let you know that I'm certainly hopeful that Conroe ISD will not make the same mistake that Willis ISD made. On that issue, on that issue, I agree with Mr. Inman. Thank you. Jason Rocha. Hello, board. Evening. Uh, first, thank you for hearing all of us out. And I, I really do wish you could uh, speak out against or with us and, um, and, and give some comment on the situation. But I know your hands are tied in, in many different ways. Um, Mr. Inman is supported by a few radical right groups. 
and these groups believe in the U.S. Constitution, the one thing that gives us freedom um, and the right to choose what life we want to live. But I don't believe they actually believe in freedom. I believe they believe in power. And so what they do, typically, is they, they find these candidates that they can control. And they run them. And because you guys have created such a fantastic uh, district, nobody votes here. So then, the radical right, they steal the election, essentially. It's not stolen, but essentially. So now they have one control, a one controlled vote. So what I call for you, for you all, before they're up for election in this coming year, is start now, because they already have somebody picked to replace you. But as you start to think about running, I want you to think back. If you were endorsed by these same political groups that support Mr. Enman and that oppose the bond that just passed, because typically they're in the same boat. And if you're supported by these groups, I think you should resign too. Because you're no better than Mr. Inman in his words. And Mr. Inman, I am sorry that a lot of these people have come up and looked at you in your face and maybe said some things that were hurtful. But you did this to yourself. You did this to this community, to the LGBTQIA community, not whatever. It is the LGBTQ community. You are not a victim here. And I'm sorry that your daughter got bullied. I am. But again, that is because you made a big deal about something that wasn't a big deal. So board, I know you can't do anything. I know that your hands are tied. But your silence is much worse than your hands being tied. And I know there was a, there was a statement released by Connor ISD, but I, I there, can be, there has to be something we can do, um, whether it be new, new rules, new something. You have the majority, at least from the emails that I received from most of you. You are on the right side. You have support. I will knock on doors for you when you run for re-election. But please take this seriously. This, this county has one of the highest levels of teen suicide in one of the greatest school districts and the greatest communities. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Jay Gross. Jake? Jay Gross. Master, first go. I mean, let's go. Yeah, my name is Jay Gross. First of all, I want to thank uh, you men and ladies for your service. I do not envy your job whatsoever. I've been a pastor for 40 years, 21 of those years here in Conroe. Uh, but you guys and ladies are sitting here with targets on your chest. As I've sat here tonight and listened, I, I've come to the conclusion Dale Inman must be a fire-breathing, child-devouring monster. But the Dale Inman I've known for over 20 years is quite a different story. I've seen him house homeless individuals in their home. One young lady testified to that. I've seen him go in and help and minister to people in disaster relief when hurricanes and floods have hit this area. I've seen him feed children that had no food at home. I've even seen him go into the prison after his own daughter was assaulted and talk to the prisoner who assaulted her about forgiveness. That doesn't sound like a man filled with hate to me. We live, we live in a time where we are polarized on our views. That's obvious from here tonight. But we are Americans. And as Americans, you have a right to believe what you want to believe, and I have a right to believe what I want to believe. But you do not have a right to demand that I agree and applaud and support what you believe. I have a right to choose for myself. And the last I heard, 
that we did have freedom of speech here in this country. And we have the ability to express our opinions. Dale Inman be the first guy to admit to you he is not perfect. Sometimes we preachers put our feet in our mouths. But there's, there's no hatred in that when we're trying to express our value. And I agree with the other gentlemen from the information that I know, Dale did not direct one word toward one student or one child. It was about an adult male entertainer that works in an adult male club coming to teach or demonstrate cosmetology to students. I don't think that's the kind of representatives that we want in Conroe schools to address our children. So I just want to come today to say to you a word of reference character reference for Dale, and also to express um, the Judeo-Christian values that are under attack, whether we want to believe it or not. Uh, and I've experienced this personally myself. When, and I'm out of time? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Renee Ver Verhagen or Matt Hoffman? Uh, Matt's much better at speaking than I am, unfortunately, <laughs> so he's going to take over. <laughs> Good evening, madam, gentlemen. Uh, Appreciate y'all giving us this time. Uh, there's a lot more that we want to say that would take a lot longer than three minutes. So I'm going to do the best that I can, kind of ad-lib this a little bit. But uh, I want y'all to think for a moment about a child that's here in the Conroe Independent School District right now. That child has autism. And that child goes to school every day with parents that really care about him, do everything that they can for him even going as far as spending thousands of dollars to try to get outside resources and outside assistance for that child. And those parents do everything they can addressing what they can with the administration of this school, leading from the teachers to the principals to the executive administration, yourself, Dr. Noll. They've been lied to, they've been misled, They've been paid lip service for over six years. No services continue to be provided. Even though testing has been done, four out of five criteria are met for dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia. But the fifth one, he doesn't have the intellect. Therefore, we'll deny the service. Anybody that's around this child for just a few moments will find out how intelligent he really is how smart he is, how quickly he figures things out. But these parents continue to struggle and nobody does anything. Now imagine for a moment, gentlemen, that that child is your child. And you will begin to understand the frustration that these parents, yourself, could begin to feel. There's no words that I could say today, standing up here, to convince you otherwise to step in our shoes. I will tell you that this child is not my child. I stepped in almost five years ago to a widowed lady with an autistic son, and I have never looked back. And I praise God every single day for blessing me with the most intelligent young man that I've ever had the pleasure of coming across and I just look for somebody within this board to give us the opportunity to ensure that this child gets a chance. I know I'm going to cut close on the time, but I'll tell you this story real quick. I ran into a 22-year-old the other day, autistic child, young gentleman, who was in the New Caney School District. And early on, he was identified as having autism. 
instead of getting services, they eventually tested him out and moved him over to life skills where he continued that and was placed in that life skills class. He struggles to this day, and I do apologize for taking up the time, but understand this is a systemic problem. It needs to be addressed, and we need to do something Thank immediately. You. Kevin Williams. Good evening, board. Thank you all. The issue here tonight seems to be this. Does the CISD board support this winch hut mentality and the attacks on a board member for having his own personal views? That's the, that's the issue. The inappropriate decision that started this was made by a teacher and the principal to invite a drag queen into the school to interface with the students. Share personal contact info, Facebook page, you know, so they can stay in touch. This was a bad decision then, it's a bad decision now. Bad decision in Willis, really bad decision here in Conroe. It's possibly in violation of Texas Penal Code 4324, which deals with the sale, distribution, and display of harmful material to minors. And even this person's conduct there as a sexual oriented performer, performs at strip clubs, could well fall under this. This was wrong, as I say, and is still wrong. The, Mr. Inman is not the bully here. He didn't address anything to the students. His crime is being a Christian and having a Facebook page. He may have, he has been alleged, well, uh, Mr. Williams, great to hear your comments beforehand about the conduct of the meeting, and we're not gonna have comments that are gonna smear people and whatnot, and yet I've heard any number of personal smears, baseless and defamatory allegations made against Dale tonight. It wasn't in my comments. Well, it was in the intro comments. No, it was not. Yeah. Um, the, I think the parents here, well, the, the point I was making, he's been alleged to say that the LGBT community is hateful. Not the students, but that the community. Perhaps he's experienced that by responses he's gotten from them. I don't know what he based it on. I've seen evidences that that's true as well. They have a cancel culture that if you come out against them, they will come down with all their might and try and enforce it. And the question is, why are they so determined to enforce their agenda? Why do we have drag queens insisting on reading to preschoolers? They don't have any kids of their own. They need your kids. And they're there to enforce their agenda on your kids. That's the agenda that they're pushing. I think it's, uh, we heard about transgender as being part of it too. And I think it's interesting that we're, uh, uh, you know, attacked if we say that there's only two genders left. It's ironic that when these people go to get gender surgery, the surgeon only asks them which one they want, male or female. Thank you. John Wirtz. What's his last name? Wirtz. John Wirtz. Yep. John Board, Dr. Null. Good evening. Uh, my name is John Wirtz. I'm Treasurer of the Republican Party. Uh, I have two grown kids. Uh, the younger son has been in the Army for 10 years. He's in the reserves, and he's a combat veteran. If that makes me a right-wing radical, I'm guilty. When we send our kids to school, there's an expectation that they will be learning how to read, write, and do arithmetic without having teachers trying to indoctrinate them with their own personal social agendas. How about we just like our kids be their kid our kids as I am watching how all this is playing out I can't believe that there are people here tonight calling for the resignation of a board member because he had the nerve and a First Amendment right to take a stand against having an adult entertainer come into our schools 
to interact with our students. I am, I am un under the understanding that the adult entertainer in question has no credentials to practice cosmetology as required by the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulations. And we don't even know if a background check was done on this guy. Seems like drag queen was the only qualification this person had, and that seems to have been fine with Willis ISD. I would sincerely hope that this is not okay with any of you. So in an effort to impart some sanity into this process, I want to call for the immediate resignation of any board member here tonight who thinks that what Willis ISD did was a good idea or is any way defensible. Because if you are okay with that and you are so feckless as to allow yourself to be pushed around and bullied by the crowd, some of the crowd here tonight, you can't be trusted with our children and you have no business making decisions that affect the families living within CISD. Thank you. Emily Hoppel. I'll try not to use my full three minutes. I know it's a long meeting. Thank you for the time. Um, I looked today uh, at the Conroe ISD website, the vision statement. CISD is a learning community united in its commitment to ensuring all students graduate with confidence and competence. Uh, goal number one is student achievement and post-secondary success for, again, all students. And goal number five is safe schools. Uh, ensure a safe and orderly environment conducive to learning for all students and staff. Love it. Um, I don't see anything anywhere, nor do I think I want to see anywhere, a promise that I will always agree with everything my children are told in school. I think that leads to really great conversations at home. Uh, certainly we do have those kinds of conversations from time to time. Um, I get you feel attacked, but people are using your words up here. They're your words, and I, I mean, we can all see them. You, you post them in public for everyone to see. You say them to public media for everyone to see, including students in this district. And so when you say something like an entire community is vile or that America is being infected, um, that includes, <clears throat> for some people, they're going to assume that you mean them when you say the LGBTQIA community is vile. So whether you were specifically saying it about students or not, I think it's safe to say since we had students here tonight that that's they're feeling that that's addressed to them. So um, I just, I guess what I want is, uh, I'll say this, uh, you belong here no matter your abilities, your perceived limitations, uh, if you're gay or straight or transgender or cis, uh, if you have great, great grandparents who were born in Texas or if you just moved here, you belong here. Um, your eye color, your skin color, they all belong. And if you're Muslim or Christian or Buddhist, you belong. Or if you're one of millions of people living happily without religion, we all belong here. Doesn't matter who we vote for, we belong here and you represent us too. Um, I want every kid in this district to feel the way that that beautiful young woman who came up here and spoke so lovingly about you feels. And I hope that you will taste your words. I really do because they do matter and they do hurt people. And that's probably all I need to say. Thank you. Thank you. Enrique Rosario. Hi, good evening. Thank you for your attention. My name is Enrique Rosero. I am a parent of a seven-year-old and a taxpayer in the district. And I just wanted to thank you all for the, all the work you did uh, to provide us with accurate 
and useful information for the school bond. I had the privilege to volunteer at the polls, and I saw the enthusiasm, the optimism, and the courage that people were coming to vote for the bond. Um, it was important that you put out faithful and accurate information, given the fact that advocates of anti-public education, or I don't know what, were trying to undermine this bond. So I wanted to thank you, the professionals that work for the school district, all the people that show leadership, all the parents that came out to help us, and all the volunteers that we had, and everyone that used their voice and their opportunity to help this great district to get the resources they need to continue to provide great edu education for our children. So I just want to thank you for all the effort that you put in. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> all right. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. All right, next item on the agenda. I'm presiding over this meeting today. No, I'm gonna ask you to leave the board meeting if you keep interjecting. Okay, I just want that clear that you're not gonna abide by the Thank you. All right, next item on the agenda, consent agenda. I, I apologize, I was stuck in traffic. I'm Catherine Loggins, I have the first spot. May I please, please register? Did she register? She signed up first, yes. Thank you. Please. Um, my name is Catherine Lagas. I'm here tonight to speak to you as a CISD parent, a community member, a former educator, and as a nurse. Fifteen years ago, on my 21st birthday, someone raped me. It took me 13 years to be able to talk about what happened to me. It took a secondary trauma as a nurse to realize that I had survived my sexual assault but had not healed from it. While some of you may think that what is that what the center of conversation is tonight was not rape. I'm here to tell you that whether he is raping them or not is not the point. He has taken advantage of a position of power to make children feel vul vulnerable, shamed, and objectified. I'm here to tell you that all too often we make conversations about assault and bullying about the victim. We try to explain what makes victims victims to begin with, further amplifying the effects of the assault. Children are minors. We do not give them resources or authority to put themselves in situations, especially when they're at school, to be anything other than subordinate to adults. It is our job to ensure that the adults responsible for their care and success are adults worth the privilege of being around our children and all children. The story we're here to talk about tonight is not my story or the story of these children. We should be focused on a man who claims to be religiously and morally right but who had a choice between decency and dominance and chose dominance. He chose dominance to hurt children like yours and like mine. There's a very uncomfortable conversation we should be having anyway, but in this case are all but forced to have because this man used his gender, his masculinity, and the sense of entitlement implied in all of those things to damage or even delete the self-respect, self-esteem, and self-worth of students. As parents, as educators and as advocates for all children everywhere. We must decide if we want to teach our children to be decent human beings who, whether they like others or not, are respectful of others and themselves. If the answer is yes, then we must begin by surrounding our children by safe adults who empower, inspire, and nourish this respect by modeling it themselves, allowing anything less is a crime against them and our community. If we tell our children that they are important, that their success, health, and well-being are important to us, then we ought to first show them that those things are true. My request to you tonight is not as a victim or as a woman or as a mother. My request to you tonight is as a fellow parent and citizen in CISD and in our community. I'm asking you, please, all of you, to prioritize the education and potential of our children by considering their health and safety. Choosing our children is not a choice between Republican or Democrat. Choosing children over sexual predators is choosing right over wrong. Choosing the safety of our children is showing faith in their futures over our fear of the other. 
Choosing our children's safety is the easiest way to promote a pro-life agenda. Choose their lives now and their lives forevermore. There's no room. All right. You have to go home tonight and look your children in the eye and know where you stand on this issue. Thank you. There's one right side. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. Uh, we're going to take a quick recess for about three or four minutes. So right now the meeting is in recess. Appreciate that. All right, consent agenda, item three. Gentlemen, I've received no request to remove anything. Anyone have any objections? If I'm not, I'm going to approve the consent right. agenda. Item three is presented. We have a second. A, have a second. Discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Thank you. Motion passes. Um, item four, curriculum and instruction. Uh, Dr. Noel received 2018-2019 SAT, ACT, advanced placement in high school completion results. Dr. Noel. All right. Mr. Colson will present this item. President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Noel, tonight we're uh, delighted to share with you some of our academic accomplishments for the class of 2019. Uh, before we get into the, the data, I want to thank the members of our team who helped pull this information together. Uh, they were invaluable assets. Uh, the true recognition for this goes to the campuses where the teachers and uh, administrators, counselors work so hard with our students to prepare them to res res uh, achieve these results. Tonight we're going to focus on college career military readiness because it is an, a, a huge factor in our accountability rating. Uh, depending upon the campus, almost 47% of a school's accountability rating can be made up by CCMR factors. Uh, the state's expectation is that when a student graduates from high school, that they earn a CCMR point. And the way the, those can be accomplished are in a variety of ways. First, by scoring a three or higher on an AP exam. By the, through the Texas Success Initiative, measures college readiness by using scores earned on SAT, ACT, and the TSI AccuPlacer. Um, not to go into any details, but a score of 480 in critical reading and 530 in math would qualify you as a college-ready student. Um, you can earn three hours, uh, college hours, through dual credit programs, or a total of nine hours in a variety of dual credit programs. Earning an associate degree, uh, earn more than one of 200 industry-based cert certifications that are available to our students and enlist in one of the branches of the United States military. Um, college readiness is defined by a prediction that a student will earn a grade of C in a college level course based upon those scores. Uh, we always start by talking about our graduation rate because everything that we do from the time students enter school is focused on reaching graduation so that students can graduate with their cohort. As you can see, over 95% of our students graduate with their cohort. Um, this is the second year that students have had a chance to earn endorsements um, in five areas, science, technology, engineering, and math, um, business and industry, public service, um, arts and humanities, and multi multidisciplinary students. The class of 2019, 96% of our seniors earned more, one or more endorsements, and that's a tremendous improvement from the previous year. Mr. Colson, can I ask yes, a question sir. about that slide? Yes, sir. Back. I'm sorry. Oh, you're going the wrong way. <laughs> Oops, sorry. So can you give me an idea? The uh, increases seem to have almost doubled. I know the system kind of implemented the endorsements. Yes. Is that the reason for the dramatic change? Uh, that's part of it. Uh, I think the fact that being in the second year of the endorsement plan and working with students and developing so a plan. More of them are seeing opportunities more of them to gain seeing those opportunities. Okay, great. And just the fact that uh, we require the four by four students to complete yes. four years of uh, English, math, science, and social studies yes. is a huge step forward in achieving those goals. Okay, thank you. Mr. Colson, may I ask a question as well? Yes, sir. You mentioned um, students graduating with their cohorts. Yes, sir. Um, let's say, for instance, a student starts but graduates early. They take summer school. They go to hawk and get on an advanced program or something like that does that count negatively towards the district as them no. not graduating with their no. cohort if they graduate early no it does okay. not no it does not um, in talking about the class of 2018 because graduation data is a year lag uh, nine, like I said 95 percent of our students graduate on time those that don't graduate so you ask what happens to the 4.7 percent that didn't graduate with their cohort uh, 
about 1% of them get the GED, almost 3% of them return to school in our five-year graduates, and then less than 1% of them are dropouts, and that is far and away better than the state averages. Uh, while it's not part of the CCMR program, because we have the National Merit semifinalists here tonight, I thought it would be interesting to share our uh, National Merit data over the last five years. Uh, we had 38 <coughs> semifinalists, of which 15 were here with us tonight. 80 were commended students, which means they, uh, they scored in the top 5% in the state of Texas. And we had 44 uh, Hispanic scholars, uh, which ranked them in the top 2% of all students, identifying themselves at, at least one quarter percent Hispanic uh, in the test. Uh, SAT performance, and that's one of the huge uh, opportunities students have to earn points. Um, a score of 480 uh, in critical reading and 530 in math qualifies you for that. On the left chart, you can see that our students far outperform the state and the nation, both in both tests and the composite. Uh, the chart on the right-hand side shows that 82% of our students who, in class of 2019 who took the SAT were deemed college ready in the critical reading and writing, and 63% in, uh, in math. Uh, interesting fact that of the thousands of students that, we, uh, that took the SAT, only 15% were not deemed college ready in either uh, critical reading or math. I think that's uh, quite an accomplishment. ACT is the other big college entrance test used by most uh, colleges and universities. Uh, like the SAT, our students uh, perform better than their peers in the state and the nation. And again, to qualify on ACT, you have to make a uh, 19 in reading and a 19 in math and a 23 composite. So on the chart on the right, you can see that 75% of the students who took the ACT uh, were deemed college ready with a 19 and 59% uh, of the students in math were deemed college ready based upon the ACT. Here's a look at our five-year ACT subject data. Uh, the uh, green line is the class of 2019. Uh, our, our data has been, been very consistent. It looks like there's some gaps, but those are very small increments on the graph. Uh, so there has not been a lot of change over the last five years. Uh, the SAT, um, chart on the right shows the score trend. As you can see, the, na the nation and the state fluctuated during the last three years. And we only included three years on this chart because the SAT changed in 2017. And to compare it any earlier than that would not be, be comparing apples with apples. Uh, our scores on the other hand have seen steady increases each year on our students' performance on the SAT. SAT participation continues to grow. Um, we have increased numbers on the SAT uh, about between 150 and 200 per year, and that very closely relates to the, incre the growth of the senior class based on growth in the district each year. So we're, we're testing the, about the same percentage of kids as we go forward. Um, ACT participation dropped a little bit. We did not have the opportunity to give a school day ACT. Uh, in the past, ACT has decided that it is all or none that every high school in the district would have to agree to give a school day ACT on the same day. And when you're putting six campuses together and trying to coordinate a date, it's virtually impossible to do that. We did offer two SAT school days <clears throat> at a couple of the high schools, which have proven to be very successful. And I think as we go forward with CCMR playing such a huge role in this, that schools will consider SAT school day in the future. Our, our CISD testing trends, um, 2,477 seniors took the SAT, 1,162 the ACT, 958 took both, and 204 took the ACT only. <clears throat> the other, another way to earn a uh, college career military readiness point is through performance on an AP exam. Uh, as you can see over the last five years, uh, we continue to increase not only the number of tests that we administer, but also to the number of students that we administer the tests to. Um, we have many students who take multiple AP tests uh, over the course of their high school career. Mr. Again, Colson, yes, sir. I apologize for interrupting, but are, are these numbers, I can see how the AP trend could get include more than just one grade level. Yes. 
the SAT and ACT, is that just juniors? Is that just seniors? That, that is data on the class of 2019. Same. At any time during their high school career that they took the ACT or SAT. Took the what, highest? What the, they take the highest scores. Okay. But the advanced the placement is not strictly seniors, right? No, advanced placement runs 9 through 12. And we'll get to some of that in just a second. Um, but yeah, the, the five-year trend it shows an increase in both students participating and the number of tests they're taking. Many students take more than one test. Here's a look at three years or higher because that what, that's what earns us a point on the, uh, the CCMR indicators, a score of three or higher. Of the thousands of students, over 1,000 students who took AP exams, 62% of them uh, made a three or higher. Uh, as compared to the uh, state with 49% uh, and the nation's 60%. So our students continue to outperform. Uh, here's where we look at the, the most popular AP courses and exams taken. Uh, interestingly enough, the two with the highest numbers are a freshman and a sophomore level course. <laughs> Human geography uh, is a freshman level. World history is a sophomore level. So based upon that data, we have about 1,300 kids who come out of their sophomore year with college credit, which if you've had kids in college, that's a great savings. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> uh, another way to earn CCMR points is through the dual credit program with Lone Star College. We had 1,127 CISD students participate in dual credit la uh, uh, during the 2018-19 school year, and they earned 12,694 credit hours, and again, to get that CCMR point, you have to earn at least three hours in English, three hours or three hours in math, or a combined nine hours if you're taking other subjects. Uh, for students who want to take dual credit, who have not qualified as being college ready based on the SAT or ACT, we offer the TSI Texas, Texas Success Initiative AccuPlacer. And basically it's a test given at the college and at the high schools which if a student makes a 351 in reading and a 350 in math, it deems them to be college ready. And these are the 1,236 students um, took the test, 565 um, were, were uh, college ready in math and 972 in English. And they then took the dual credit classes. Here's a look at the dual credit courses that are most popular on our high schools and at Lone Star College. Uh, the top ones, the English uh, 1301, that is a uh, junior level course, 2332 is the, soft, uh, the senior level English class, history is a, a junior level class, and those are the number of students who, who took and earned credit in those uh, classes. There are two up there, Auto Tech and uh, EMT, Emergency Medical Technician, those are offered, one at the Lone Star College Conroe, the Auto Tech and the EMT is at the Lone Star College Montgomery. Those students actually are getting workforce credit for those, and they earn a point through that. Um, Industry-based certifications are many opportunities for our students as a result of taking CTE courses and other courses to uh, complete an industry-based certification. Last year, there were 3,025 3, students who completed one or more industry-based certifications, which also earned uh, the, the campuses in the district a CCMR point. <clears throat> uh, the last two areas for opportunities are military enlistments, and what you see there is the number of students in uh, district-wide who enroll enlisted in one of the armed branches of the armed services. Um, we feel like this may be a little underreported. It's either self-report the student indicates that they're going in, they've indicated on the senior survey they intend to enlist, we get a request, transcript request from one of the branches. Uh, or the uh, military sends us documentation. So we feel like in the future that number will, will be a little bit higher. And then uh, the last the one there is earning an associate's degree, having graduating from high school and college at the same time with the two years associate degree. And those programs are just starting and they will only get better with time as we go forward. Kind of a, a summary, um, the goal of the state of Texas by the year 2030 is that 60% of all seniors graduate with a CCMR point, deeming them to be college ready. Uh, the class of 2019, 3,953 graduates, 71% of them earned a CCMR point right. uh, that they were college ready. So we're very proud of the results we had, and, and I know that going forward we will continue to, uh, to improve. So. 
questions? Thank you, sir. If we could, I know I'm going to I'm going to miss somebody. I'm sorry. I tried to look around the room, but there's just a few folks in here that yes. not only worked hard on this report, but their leadership is what helps us get where we are. I see Denise Apola and Laura Willard from our counseling department, and Debbie McNeely, our advanced programs coordinator, and our CTE guys back in the back, Greg Schiff and Matt Clark. Um, if y'all would just stand up so we could thank you. Sorry, we're up. Uh, <laughs> You're still in charge. I'll go right on through it. Item four B: Consider approval of target improvement plan for Houston Elementary. Doctor No. All right, Doctor Phillips and Doctor Taylor, come forward. No, that's enough. All right. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Doctor No. Dr. Taylor and I are here tonight to seek your approval for the targeted intervention plan developed by Houston Elementary. We are so proud of this school and the progress they've made. And because of their great progress, this is probably the last time that we will ask you to approve their formal intervention plans. Tonight I've asked Dr. Taylor to share details regarding Houston's progress and the planning process, and then I'll follow up with some details regarding the support that we're, we're providing and in order to ensure that they continue this positive trend. Good evening. I would like to first start off by thanking the board for your unwavering support of Houston Elementary, your um, acceptance and opportunities and providing resource and just continuing to motivate the campus did not go unnoticed. And I would really like to thank you on behalf of the campus. The campus is required to have a formal leadership that deals with school improvement. And as a part of that leadership team, we have with us tonight the principal, Viviana Harris. Please stand. <laughs> Assistant principals, Teresa Waller and Vanessa Lincoln. As a part of this leadership team, I will serve in the role of district coordinator of school improvement. We also receive support from Dr. Delise Lloyd, who is a certified Lone Star governance coach, and Stacy Zalanka, who is a part of Region 6. I would also like to recognize Sam Houston Elementary staff members that are in attendance tonight. Please stand. and several other district personnel here tonight that supported the campus along this journey. As you will see from this first slide, there are many opportunities to celebrate this campus. We went from an overall 54F in 2018 to an overall 74C, and that did not happen without the work and dedication that this campus put in. As you will also see from the domain scores on this slide, which is where the campus receives their overall letter grade from each domain, there is still work to be done and we're not oblivious to that fact, but we're super proud of the gains that they have made, particularly in domain 2A. I'll call your attention to that component. This is where the state gives progress scores for kids in the area of reading and math in fourth grade. And so for this campus to grow from 59 to 75, it was about focusing on individual student needs. This information uh, contains a three-year trend on the approaches passing standard for STAR, and as you will see, the campus continues to make incremental steps in improvement for in the areas of reading, math, and writing, and we will continue to improve in those areas. So we're super proud of the gains that are made in each area for this campus. These scores are representative of kids that tested in English and Spanish. So super proud of those gains. Because Sam Houston Elementary was a campus listed as a campus in need of improvement last year, they are still required to be a campus that's called comprehensive support. And that means we're still under state and federal guidelines of what we have to prove that we are making improvements. And a part of that is the targeted improvement plan that is up for your approval tonight. The plan that you have received a copy of is probably a different format from what you're used to seeing, but this plan is driven by the state's new school improvement framework, which is called the Effective Schools Framework. And under that framework, the state has identified essential actions that deem a campus to be highly effective. And so the campus under 
uh, underwent a needs assessment and as a part of that needs assessment there were areas identified that the campus needed to work on that we had to document for the state and in that plan you will see there are milestones that the campuses will have to reach every quarter and every cycle but what's different in this plan is the district commitment on the theory of action that will happen for every cycle for this campus and so the district again will be very instrumental in making sure this campus continues to make progress to make progress. And Dr. Phillips will talk a little bit about the components of the plan. Okay, <clears throat> as Dr. Taylor shared, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, format's very different this year and it's based on the effective schools framework. And so the school, at, at the end of their needs assessment, Houston identified two essential actions that they're gonna focus on this year. The first one is all about objective-driven daily lesson plans. This is something that the school has been working on for three years, and we're real excited because at the beginning, we had district coaches there that would help the teachers through the planning process, um, e evaluating data, making changes to the instruction, but now we've got some really strong teams at Houston, and they're starting to take on that process themselves, and the district is pulling out um, of, of that role. So we're real excited to see the, the strong teachers emerging. The second essential action is compelling and aligned vision, mission goals, values focused on a safe environment. This is all about um, school safety. And um, again, Houston has been working on this. They're becoming more and more proficient and skilled at using positive behavior interventions and supports to support students in managing their own behavior. So we're seeing the behavior come under control, kids um, being reflective about what they're doing and, and kids managing themselves in a better way. And so finally, we wanna share with you just some of the support that we're gonna to continue to provide this year. We're excited to, to be um, continuing with our family engagement liaison made a huge impact on the community um, and the way that they're supporting the kids. Uh, we have a positive behavior support liaison just for Houston that's been there, um, this is the third year. We have lower than average class sizes at Houston. Uh, the content teacher leaders that I uh, referenced earlier um, are receiving some specialized training. Uh, Dr. Taylor, the district coordinator of school improvement is out there bi-monthly. And then we also have data meetings with her assessment team. So every time uh, one of the grade levels takes an important assessment, the assessment team is there to help them analyze the data. And then uh, curriculum and instruction is out there still with district coaches, Dr. Upshaw, continuing support with content and instruction. And then this spring, we're gonna be partnering with uh, Region 6 to um, administer an ESF diagnostic, which is an effective schools framework diagnostic to give them even more direction for the coming year. So unless you have any questions or comments, we seek your approval of this plan. Gentlemen. I move approval of the plan as presented. Second. I have a motion, second, discussion. All in favor? I, I oh, like oh, oh, that's no comments. Go I ahead, sir. Make a comment. Um, things don't change if things don't change, and obviously they have changed, and it takes leadership. And uh, I just want to commend the leaders, uh, Dr. Taylor. I know you're out there more than twice a month. <laughs> I bet your car's got lots of miles on it running back and forth out there. But thank you to everyone. Uh, Ms. Harris, thank you for your leadership on the campus. We really appreciate it. And I just want to say uh, that's a big improvement to go from where we were to where we are. And I also thank you for recognizing that there's still more room for improvement. The one thing that I constantly try to push is we can always get better. It doesn't matter who we are or where we are, we can always get better. And I'm glad that you have that attitude. And I'm glad you're supporting that campus the way you are. Uh, and I commend you for it. Thank you. Well said, we have a motion second, all in favor? Outstanding, motion passes. Thank you, all right. Item uh, 4C, uh, con consider approval of 2019-2020 campus improvement plans. Dr. No. All right, Dr. Phillips and Mr. Colson, please. President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. No, we're here tonight to present the campus improvement plans that were developed on each campus. Campus planning is required annually for all public schools. Schools conduct a needs assessment and then use data to develop a comprehensive plan to improve teaching and learning. Our plans are developed annually by the campus principal with the support of their site-based teams. 
These plans directly align with the district improvement plan in order to help the district achieve our goals. Yes, and, and once the needs are, are determined by the needs assessment, the campus um, uh, designs goals and strategies to meet the needs. And when you looked over the plans, you noticed there's some common format to all of the plans. All of the plans have addressed uh, a student achievement and post-secondary success, recruitment, development, and retention of staff. They also address parent and community engagement, school safety, and technology. And so we know you've had the opportunity to look these over already. So um, if, unless you have questions, we're asking your approval of the campus improvement plans. Thank you. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Gentlemen, any discussion? I'd like to say one thing. Go ahead, sir. Uh, we, most of us have started there at one point in our time, you know, with our own children or mm -hmm. our, own, our own neighborhood schools or whatever and served in those roles. And I just like to say that it's harder to read 60 than it was 64 than it was 38. <laughs> okay, way back when in, in my younger days. Uh -huh. But the, we do know, I mean, just because they are similar, they are individual. Yes. And they are so very important, and we support you. And just because we don't talk about each individual one, and they have to go to us so that we don't kill trees uh, electronically and so on and so forth, I just think it's important to point out that the work that those volunteers, the parents, the, and, the, and the staff, and the principals, and everybody else goes to does not need to be uh, brushed over, but, you know, just run through, or this is not just for format, okay? Yeah. This is their important. So, thank you. Hard work. Hard work. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. yes, thank you, gentlemen. All right, we have a motion second. All in favor? Motion passes. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, item 4D, consider approval 2019-2020 district improvement plan, Dr. Noll. I want to make sure I get this introduction right because I'm not sure if we have shared this with you all yet, but to present this item will be Dr. Shelley Winkler. All right. It has been over a year, so thank you. <laughs> well, I don't think I've introduced you. Since I still appreciate it. <laughs> oh, for another year. Yeah. Dr. Winkler, I brought it up a year ago. He did. Okay. All right. I just want thank to make you. sure. Thank you. We kind of forget, it's, you know, that you go through all that work. But we like to be time. reminded. So <laughs> hey, well, good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Noll. Similar to the campus improvement plan, state law requires the annual development of the district improvement plan under the direction of our superintendent. The development of this plan is done in conjunction with the district level planning committee, district uh, deputy and assistant superintendents, directors, coordinators, and specialists within each department. The purpose of the plan is to guide the district in its continuous improvement of student performance for all student groups in, a su in such a way that it aligns to the state standards, including the accountability system. The Connor ISD District Improvement Plan includes the required provisions of a comprehensive needs assessment, much like the campuses that Dr. Phillips um, described, that addresses student achievement with appropriate measures of performance, which identifies and analyzes the needs of each student group. It also addresses the strategies for student improvement, including instructional methods to help students meet their full potential. This includes not only academic needs, but safe schools, discipline management, dropout prevention, suicide prevention, career education, and accelerated education. The professional, need, uh, professional development needs of staff are also addressed to fulfill these goals and identified within the plan. The plan also includes strategies for junior high and high school students, parents, and teachers regarding information on higher education admissions, grants, financial aid opportunities, and making informed curriculum choices. Resources, timelines, and staff members responsible for implementing and monitoring the district improvement goals are outlined within the plan. The district improvement plan, much like the campus plan, is also a working document and may be modified as necessary throughout the year. To assess ongoing needs, formative evaluation criteria are identified to ensure that the plan is producing the intended results. We are appreciative of the collective efforts of those involved in the development of this year's plan, and at this time we ask that for you to approve the 2019-2020 district improvement plan. So moved. I have a motion. Second. Second. I have a second. All in uh, discussion, gentlemen? All right. All in favor? Motion passes. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Dr. Winkler. Thank you. 
Dr. Lynn. <laughs> All right, let's keep it going. Item five, administration, we receive 2020-2021 uh, calendar, school calendar information. All right, Dr. Hines. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Noll. Uh, I'd like to kind of take an opportunity to share a little bit of information about the development of the 2021 school calendar. We're starting that process. Actually, we started last month with the district level committee. It is the group that is responsible for developing the school calendar to present to you as a recommendation for your approval and consideration. Uh, the committee will develop one or more draft calendars and will receive input on those calendars from the community and the schools. They will be posted on our website um, for review. Usually we this will happen later in the month um, and we'll leave them up for roughly a month. Um, it is anticipated that we will present our recommendation to you at the January 2020 meeting. That's our kind of our timeline. Um, we did start the process with a discussion in November. We will continue the discussion tomorrow. Um, and obviously, one of the reasons I'm here is if you have any feedbacks or feedback or comments you would like me to bring to our meeting tomorrow, um, be more than happy to, to carry that back. Uh, in December, we don't traditionally have a district level meeting. Um, we do meet in January before the board meeting to try to review what the feedback is and have a recommendation hopefully at that board meeting okay. just a few highlights um, we have a district of innovation plan which this is the third year I think it's a three-year approval and that allows us uh, to begin the first day I have the first day prior to what would be August the 24th this year would be the first allowable day otherwise uh, we have when we have a calendar we have to ensure that it meets a minimum of 75,600 instructional minutes and for the last several years, we've included uh, additional minutes for two inclement weather days, uh, which we've already used this year. Um, and probably next month, we'll be bringing you a waiver for Caney Creek that missed a couple of extra days, um, but they um, won't have to make up those days because they had two days built into their calendar. Actually, more than two, they had three. Um, the CISD calendar may include four early release days. We've used those in the past for teacher conferences or collaboration, collaborative teacher planning. And then we try to be careful with our holidays. We look at the assessment calendar. Things we do know, uh, we currently have 177 days for our students and our teachers work 187 days. Uh, so the two inclement weather days is 76,440 minutes. We use uh, traditionally a 430 minute calendar for uh, all the schools except the high schools. They do a 435 minute calendar because they do a couple of uh, extra early release days for uh, exams in both the fall and the spring. Um, we also have four early release days at the end of each nine week period. Uh, we currently waive a total of 1,620 minutes and this question comes up 2,100 minutes are the maximum that we can waive. So we could waive up to what is equivalent to five school days. And, and that's become an issue, the last, the last bullet there about HB3, uh, certainly we have, we're planning for reading academies uh, and some other training, we're implementing, we're expanding dyslexia, we're doing some things with full day pre-K next year, and so uh, certainly the discussion is, could we use extra days built in for training during the year since there's a lot uh, that is packaged in House Bill 3 that we're still unpacking. Um, we have traditionally in the past taken off uh, just a few of the days that we'll mention, Labor Day and MLK Day, uh, Memorial Day. This year we, uh, we did put a calendar out just to kind of get some feedback to try to help guide us in the calendar development. We actually had pretty good responses, th over 3,660 responses to the calendar survey. Uh, we know that the calendar does affect uh, family schedules and the county as a whole. Uh, so we get some really uh, interesting responses. Uh, we, we did get generally feedback. People like starting midweek. So we used to, we've done Monday starts and we've done midweek starts. And although we try to avoid those three day weeks, that one seems to be a real popular three day week. Um, and so we like starting midweek. Uh, gives everybody off to a good shorter week start. 90% um, of the feedback wanted to end the semester prior to winter break. So we know that's important to folks. 67% of the responders said that they uh, would like to begin on or after August 17th, so they want a little bit later start. However, 78% want to end the semester prior to winter break more than that. So if, if they had to choose between starting earlier or ending the winter break, they'd rather start earlier. 
80.5% would rather end in May than start after August 17th. So we asked them to check, choose, which one would you prefer, starting later or ending earlier? And they, they would prefer to start earlier and end earlier. Um, in general, there's always uh, people that didn't and feel that way. The week off of Thanksgiving is very popular, 85% like that full week. Um, the October holiday is popular, 56% would prefer that day off in October as opposed to beginning later. So if they had to pick a day, they'd rather start earlier and have their October day. 82% um, though said they'd give up that October holiday if it meant they had to lose their full week at Thanksgiving. So <laughs> we, did, we did ask them to make some value uh, judgments on the survey. Um, so we know three-day weeks are generally a challenge for us. 75% like the three weekends that are su uh, successive in our winter break. So that seemed to be popular. Spring break, we can move that, and we typically look at uh, where they're going to fall. We do not know. We like to look at Sam Houston State, A&M, UT, and uh, Lone Star College. Um, and we will, Dr. Hines, I, I spoke to Dr. Head today. We will have Lone Star College at spring break tomorrow, so we'll be able to have that. Okay, so we'll know. Right now, the only one we've been able to find online is Texas, and that's March 15th through the 20th. Well, that's when it needs to be. There you go. <laughs> 56% said they like early release days at the end of the nine, each nine weeks. 74% would prefer a February holiday to a staff development day. Just saying. 80% um, 80, 80 indicated that they preferred having four staff development days prior to the school, and they liked that day in January. 56% prefer, and what, what that means is we, we took a day this year off of the front end, and we put it in November, but we also have a day in January. Um, 56% uh, prefer the, the current number of minutes and instructional days. Uh, we do get a lot of debate about the balanced semesters. And so, you, you know, you heard people want to end the semester before winter break. Um, a lot of folks that responded really don't care how balanced it is, but the ones who do care, care a lot. Um, and so uh, for a portion of the responders, it was not the big number, but it was their number one priority. So we had, we had some statements where they had to prioritize one through six. And what that tells us is if you teach a one semester course at high school, that's really important to you. And so you, you might have responded that way on the survey. Um, it, and it was actually pretty interesting. We've talked about having a, a student holiday and maybe a staff development day on election day because many of our sites hold elections. And that was actually the lowest rank of the six statements, so it didn't seem to be that popular of an idea with folks, and maybe it's because it falls on a Tuesday, I don't know, um, but it didn't get a lot of, a lot of traction. But it is being discussed by the district level planning committee. This is the blank where we start with for planning um, this year's calendar, uh, and this is just kind of a quick reminder of what our current calendar looks like. You can see our first day of school in uh, 2019 was the mid midweek, August the 14th. Um, and, and pretty much all of the uh, draft calendars that we've been looking at, uh, next year Memorial Day falls very late, so we likely will be out before Memorial Day. Um, but until we have a calendar to bring you, I can't say that for sure, uh, but it looks very possible given the date. Uh, and so if there's any feedback that you'd like me to bring back or any uh, thing that you want us to look at, we'll be sure to do that. I, I have one question and one comment, and I don't dispute the, the information on your election day at all. I know that's what you got, but it contradicts what I heard personally from constituents following election day this last year. And we all know we hear from people who are upset a whole lot more than we hear from people who are happy. Mm -hmm. um, but I did get some feedback that people were concerned about children being on campus on election day and with it being a major presidential election year um if that's something we could i know i know it ranked lowest on your your one through six scale but i i have personally heard feedback about that one absolutely and then the other one was how actively do you solicit feedback specifically from extracurricular instructors and and let, let me give you my reason for asking if it helps specify your answer i know we had an issue uh, a couple of years ago, I believe it was a color guard from College Park or something that had planned a trip and weren't able to, fell on Star Week or something, that's out of our control. Um, we've had, I think, a band trip that was scheduled for the end of this year that they're not able to go because it's too close to graduation and things like that. So is there a way where we can get input from those types of groups 
further ahead of time, actively seek their input further ahead of time so we can know that this group is already planning a spring trip in 2021 and is that going to affect our spring break or Easter or something like that that, that may because we don't I don't like when we when those groups plan those trips you know they start working on them two years out with the boosters and they get six months out and we say oh you can't go we, we do share the information uh, you know obviously that is I think you just hit on what the biggest challenge is when you're planning two years out and we haven't done the calendar right. yet it, it's it's problematic and uh, the assessment calendars are released in batches so um, I'm not sure if the next year assessment calendars out but that's caught people before as well where they make a plan and then here come the star schedules and we've had to adapt uh, and there's been some changes over the years uh, on that one so it's kind of difficult but um, I think the hardest part has been and we do try to share it and push out this information uh, and from the looks of the responses we had pretty good response about half of those 3600 were teachers or staff members so we feel like we got good response um, you know but we will always try to do a better job and I think we can do we can do more to push it out but I think as you mentioned the biggest challenge is they may have already made plans and we haven't made the calendar yet and so we're, we're a little bit kind of chasing that but we'll work on it thank you dr. Hunt. any other question all right all right let's go item 5b receive attendance zone update of four elementary schools in the woodlands and college park feeders dr no dr. Hines. Dr. Hines. all right i'll just keep going um keep and going. we do have some uh maps posted uh, we are working on the other process that i brought to you a couple of months ago which is the junior high stockton junior high opening in conroe and we'll be back in um december to give you an update on that process and then hopefully we'll have a recommendation for you at the january board meeting uh, so having said that, we are now beginning a process for uh, looking at the attendance boundaries for some of our elementaries and intermediate schools in the, the Woodlands and the College Park feeder. Um, and as we've talked about before, the number one reason we do this because we keep growing. Uh, we are um, increased 1,750 students since the end of last year uh, as where we were on November the 6th. Uh, we are up 2,184 students since the the Monday after or the Tuesday after Labor Day um, last year so you can see our growth continues to be steady um, we also do this when we open new schools as such as the case of uh, Stockton junior high in this case we don't have a new school opening and we don't have one in this uh, five-year uh, bond plan for the Woodlands College Park uh, feeder and so we're looking at uh, trying to address some of those issues we know this is going to be challenging because we've we've not addressed it um, probably been about nine or ten years since we've adjusted attendance zones in this area schools our communities we know that people have a history with their school we know they often purchase their home to go to a particular school so we know this is a close to home topic and we we try to be um, as sensitive and careful as we can as we go through it um, but let me kind of give you a little quick update on why we're doing this uh, we have some campuses that are over capacity and we have some campuses that have some room and uh, so we'll start with the ones that we have a little bit of room uh, Derrichin currently is at 74 percent capacity and I use capacity roughly because we know that's a moving target it fluctuates based on programming and sometimes just one or two students can create another class um, Gladys is approximately at 79 percent capacity Buckaloo is roughly at 86 percent and Tuff is roughly at 78 percent capacity uh, so we know we have some schools that have a little bit of room then we have some schools that we need to find a solution for and ride is number one on that list we currently have 751 students and we're roughly with 12 portable classrooms we're at 131 percent capacity so our number one objective in this process is to reduce the crowding at ride uh, Lamar Elementary which currently has enrollment of 800 students using six portable classrooms roughly at 111 uh, percent so we would like um, to reduce that number by some um, you know we used to say 120 percent if we got within 120 we were happy and we've, we've since lowered that to 110 to try to get inside of 110 and you can see Lamar's not far beyond it but we we know what we're going to do this process we want to try to look at that um, Glenlock is one that we're keeping an eye on it currently is 602 students which is approximately 104 percent capacity and they're they're holding steady they have six portable classrooms Powell uh, currently has an enrollment of 861 it's roughly at 108 percent and it has uh, three portable classrooms 
and Bush is currently at 95% capacity um, with 784 students, but they're projected to be at 136% capacity by 2025. And, and that's really due to growth along the 1488 corridor up on Old Conroe Road, uh, Foster's Ridge, which has 1,500 planned lots, of which about one third are built right now. And then there's a new development that has 1,130 planned lots coming in. So uh, we know Bush is gonna go overcrowded. So we, we while we're doing this, we're gonna look at uh, creating some room at Bush or rezoning some of those areas uh, to places we have room. So those are some of our, our objectives. Uh, we do want to be within 110 percent. We do want to plan for that growth in the 1488 corridor. We also are in a, we have to accommodate for full day pre-K programs and and that's a little bit of a challenge for us and uh, certainly that's something that's a part of this discussion in ways that we can look at either creating space or utilizing space. Um, but that's one of our objectives as well. We'll be looking at the full day pre-K uh, program as well. <coughs> to do that, we have a committee. Uh, we actually had our first meeting this morning and uh, Dr. Shelley Winkler is gonna co-facilitate that with me. And uh, I don't know if Dr. Stewart's still here, but Dr. Stewart's she was on, there. On, our, on our committee uh, as um, is Dr. Phillips and um, Katie Morton joins us from communications and Mr. Caker. Um, and Terry Ross from Information Systems as well provides support uh, and technical assistance. So we have a good group. We had our first meeting today. We're starting the process. We have goals. Uh, I've shared these with you before, so we won't go into great detail. But number one, to reduce our enrollment at overcrowded and obviously to make use of where we might have some room for some students. We do consider a lot of things, considering capacity, input, demographic factors, history, proximity, roadways, um, future school projects, um, future enrollment, transportation patterns, and so on. So we try to look at lots of things as we do this, and these are not in any particular order. We do go through uh, three kind of public sharing processes as well as have all this information online and uh, so that we will have uh, the scenarios. And all these scenarios are uh, for the junior high are available online currently, and we're taking feedback. Um, but we start in three rounds. The first round is really kind of coming up here in a couple of weeks where we'll start to share what we're doing. Uh, we'll come back about a month later, uh, hopefully with a recommendation or some options to show the community. And then we'll try to refine it, tweak it, approve it, and bring a recommendation back to that uh, community in February, followed by a recommendation to you at the February board meeting. Uh, and hopefully we'll stay on track for that. We do want you to know that we understand the significance of this task. We don't, we don't take this lightly. Um, we are committed. We believe all of our schools are outstanding, and we're committed to having an outstanding experience for our uh, patrons at any of the schools. So if we have to move someone, we hope that they'll be happy with it. Um, and we do hope to be back in February with a recommendation. Thank you, Dr. Hines. Appreciate you. Okay. All right. Um, 5D. I'm sorry, we have 5D? Yeah. All right, 5C. Consider solicitation of public or private pre-K programs, 5C. All right, Dr. Hines, once again. So tonight, uh, I'm here to ask for your approval to solicit um, <clears throat> pre-kindergarten public or private partnerships. And you know, certainly, this is part of the waiver process, and uh, I, I wanna be upfront and say, you know, our goal is to, uh, this year was year one. Uh, we have two full day programs, one at Hauser, uh, one at Houston Elementary. Uh, we are not, you know, obviously at 100%. Uh, we, we, we are hopefully going to be at 100% next year, but we're not sure. We're, we're working on it. Uh, what I want to do is give you an update tonight and share uh, where we are. Uh, certainly, I think it's very reasonable by year three. So if this is year one, if year two, if we're not at 100% by year two, we would be by year three. Um, but we do have to do a few things um, and work on a few projects. So just to give you a little background. Uh, House Bill 3, which was passed in the 86th Texas Legislature, impacts how Texas uh, public schools provide pre-kindergarten. And one of, the, one of the changes is that beginning this year, uh, we convert half-day to full-day programs, <coughs> unless we request and are granted a waiver from the state. And you know, it's been an interesting process because we, we, the year started and we didn't have instructions, and we didn't have information, we didn't have a manual, so we've been getting the information that's been coming out kind of gradually from the state. Uh, but we know the waiver process will be in January, so for this year. So we, we know it's coming up. 
Um, and I also want to be real clear that the law did not change the requirements for eligibility for pre-K, so students still have to qualify for those programs. Um, to be eligible for a waiver, a school district must demonstrate the need to construct classroom facilities and to provide pre-kindergarten classes, and that would also uh, include us uh, adding uh, portable classrooms, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, to, so to, apply, to add portable classrooms, we have to go through this process of uh, soliciting partnerships. To apply for an exemption, a school district must solicit and consider during public meetings, which we are at tonight, proposals for partnerships with public and private entities regarding offering full-day pre-kindergarten for eligible four-year-old students. We can apply for one-year, two-year, or three-year waivers. And so we'll, we know we're doing one year, and each year uh, the state gradually increases what you have to do to prove that you're working towards the goal of having full day. And so we, we, do, um, we may be asking for a two-year. Uh, hopefully we can solve it within two. There's, um, just to kind of give you a little update on where we are, and, and impact, you know, I really want to talk about impact. Going to a full day program has impact on several areas, and I'm just going to mention a few. Uh, one is classroom space, and we currently serve uh, 1,382 students in a half day program. We have 167 students that are served in a full day program. So, you know, you look at that roughly 1,500 students, um, that's another 48 classrooms that we know we've had to, to come up with. Uh, we also know that there's going to be impact on participation. So one of the things that we've seen is that the full day option is attractive and some families may take advantage of it that did not take advantage previously. So we, we anticipate there will be an increase. Um, we also know this impacts our special education uh, program, which we currently have about 20 uh, classrooms in use. So that's, that impact is a little different. It's not directly double, but, but there will be a need for more space. Uh, for our PPCD programs. There's also an impact on transportation, and there's also an impact on our space for our specials classes. So um, especially for our campuses that do not have gyms. So now you have a whole other group of students that have to rotate during the day. And so it's not just about classroom space, it's also about where they go when the teacher's at conference period. So uh, we have to look at that. And that may also impact staffing as well in other ways besides just the classroom. So we are looking at that. Uh, and on the transportation side, I just want to mention, you know, previously they go half a day. We're only transporting half in the morning to school and half home in the afternoon. It'll be the whole group coming in the morning and the whole group going home. And so there's an impact on the transportation. We Dr. have Hines. Yes, sir. Um, maybe it's because it's a long I'm, I'm struggling to understand just a couple of points. I hope you can entertain me. So we're, we're applying for waivers, but in order to do so, we have to show that we're working with public and private entities. That, we have to solicit solicit proposals. So what yes. does that what does that mean? Because I, I don't understand what that means when we have to solicit. Private. So what that means, and we'll talk a little bit more about when I get to the last slides, but it's basically going out and asking if there's a public or private <laughs> provider who offers a pre gay program who can meet what is required if they want to make a proposal of, hey, we can more or less subcontract for us services to provide pre-K, full-day pre-K services to students. But you're, but you're asking them to do it for a short period of time, not go into business and do it, and then, then we, we get into the business and then they don't have any kids. That's correct. It's a, it's a limited, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a limited venture. No doubt, and that, that has to be up front and under, understood that we plan on being able to do this in the long run. So it would be uh, potentially a short term, but if, if we like the arrangement, we could extend it. But is that, does that mean that we're compensating them in some way? We would be paying for services, yes. Contract out. Yes. Absolutely. Okay, so the 86 legislator, is that the one that just concluded in, in May? Correct. And they wanted us to convert to full time this past August? Yes. But we can apply for a waiver in January? Yes. <laughs> you're not having as much trouble as you thought yeah, you were. You're you're you got it. You're on it. Just, you're doing it. You're doing they, it. They sometimes drink in the legislature. <laughs> I, I have a question. Yes, sir. While, while you think about those answers, okay? <laughs> of the 1,300 kids that we serve for half a day right now, okay? 
How many of them ride the bus? Do you know that? I do not know offhand. Because that's pretty pertinent when you all of a sudden go from using that bus. Over half. Over half? Yeah. Okay. Because, I mean, you just divide that number of kids by whatever, you know, and, I mean, I don't know how many different locations they're going to be at, but that is a bunch of buses. It, it's, it in is. The no, it, it you is. You don't have that many buses left over. You know, just I, running the math on it, we, we, we it's, a, it's about eight to ten buses extra. Just to run, just to allow for the extra ridership. Yes. Well, yeah, if they're eight, if they're in eight or ten places, but if they're in more than eight or ten places, I'm not sure what you're telling me. Well, uh, in you terms know, of I, uh, if they ride on the existing routes they're riding on, in other words, we already have routes going through those neighborhoods picking up pre-K students. Now we're picking up more students. We would have to add buses to accommodate the extra riders. Yeah, but if you contract it out, then you got to. Figure out logistically. Oh, no, well, there would not be transportation okay. for the private providers. Okay. I want to make that real clear. And transportation is not required for pre K. That's something we provide in our school district, but it would not be required for private providers. I, got you. I want to be clear on that. I, I got to go back. I'm sorry. That's okay. Because I'm trying we're, to, we're figuring it out too. I, so. I'm, trying to, I'm trying to figure out how, like, to get this waiver, you're going to, pub, to private entities i mean is that something that that the school district is actually doing right now like you have like a, a, a requirement hey can you meet these requirements on our behalf yes and then well we have well, well, with your permission we will ask those questions yes that's at the conclusion the end of this presentation okay i'll be maybe, maybe i'm yeah. jumping up. go ahead but those requirements let me try to get to that and then oh, um, but, I'm sorry. but that's a great question also with us is miss tammy zunker who is our coordinator of uh, elementary math and early childhood programs. So, so if you see me look over at Ms. Zunker, it's because I'm like, what is that answer? Um, so, but we're, we're gonna be all right. Um, so just putting together kind of a quick chart, we've been, and, and again, this is very rough and we're working through it, um, but you can see all the green places we've marked, up, these are elementary schools that we think, hey, we've got it, right? We can, we can do this, we're gonna order the furniture, order the stuff start scheduling bus riders and uh, hire some teachers and we'll be ready to go. And so uh, Creighton, we have room, Milam, we have room, San Jacinto, we have room, Anderson, Armstrong, Reeves, and Wilkinson. Um, Austin's a little tight. We have six portable classrooms. As you know, one of the first elementaries out of the box will be an elementary in uh, Caney Creek feeder zone, which we will do a lot of rezoning in elementary, which will create some capacity. But next year is going to be tight at Austin, and we'll have to look at that. And there are many options. There are options about either we can bring in more portables, or we can uh, look at staying half day for another year, or we can look at clustering with another school. And those are options that we have on all of these tough situations. Uh, Giesinger is another one that's tight. We currently have six portables. Now uh, they would need one more. We do have limited space. We're looking at that. We also are looking at the possibility could we cluster a program with Houston where there's room. Um, Houston currently has the program. Patterson we think can do it, but we probably will need a portable which would require this waiver and require the solicitation of the uh, private partnerships. The uh, Rice Elementary, is probably able to do this. We have room, we've had portables there before, certainly, but it would probably require another portable classroom to do that. Uh, Runyon Elementary is a maybe. Uh, we currently have six portables, but we know we're about to do some construction over there, and so we're sensitive to that. And we may be needing, we may be wanting to move portables, not bring them in. So certainly Runyon is one we're looking at. And Stewart's a tight site we're looking at. Um, that one can be solved, but probably a portable classroom is gonna be needed. Uh, at Stewart. Uh, in the Grand Oaks feeder system, we're going to look at doing a couple of things to move some things around. Currently, Burnham Woods has a pre K program. Most of the students that are in that program come from Kaufman. So we're looking at bringing a program to Kaufman um, and then moving the program from Snyder, where we're tight, we're at capacity at Snyder, where we would. Um, we would look at moving the program to Burnham Woods. So Burnham Woods would keep a program, we would just change the attendance boundaries for that. Uh, Snyder is tight, but if we shift to Burnham Woods, we would be okay. And then in Oak Ridge, Ford's getting tight. Uh, we would, to accommodate this, have to add a couple of portables. We've had more portables there, so we certainly have the room. We've also talked about clustering, and that's an option we're looking at with Hauser has some room. Um, Suchma currently has capacity. Um, 
but it's tight. We've been growing very rapidly at Suchman's, our new school, and so we're watching it closely. And again, that's one of those we could cluster with Hauser if we needed to. Uh, and by cluster, we mean our students would go to that school for their full day program. And as you notice in uh, some of our feeder zones, a lot of our campuses do not have programs. We cluster where we bring students to another location. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then looking at the woodlands and the College Park feeder area, you can see we do not have pre-K programs at, currently at Buckaloo, Bush, Derrickson, or Galatis. We do have one at Glenlock. We've looked at that. We're watching it real carefully. One of the things we have to be careful about is sometimes a school is qualifying for Title I. If we move a pre-K program, we may unintentionally unqualify them, and so we want to be real uh, mindful of that. Powell Elementary currently is a tight location. They have a pre-K program. We, we think we can make it work with, uh, we might be able to move another program that's located there, or uh, certainly we could look at a cluster option at another location. Um, and we look at the College Park feeder. Uh, David does not have a program. Haley does have a program. They currently could do it with their existing space. They currently have nine portals. They're not using all of them, and so we have some room there without adding. Uh, Lamar is a maybe. Uh, again, we want to watch Lamar carefully for the Title I impact. And so we're watching and looking at options for those. So you can see we have a potential solutions for pretty much most everything, but because we are going to have to uh, use some portable classrooms to solve, we would have to do the waiver and seek the partnerships. And so it's a, it is a formality that we, we would have to go through. So the requirements are, according to the Texas Education Code, is to invite proposals for partnerships with public or private entities regarding required pre-kindergarten classes. They must include specific information regarding how the entity will comply with high quality pre-kindergarten program requirements under the Texas Education Code. And they must include at a minimum information and or documentation of the following. And certainly I have examples of the questionnaire that'll be online if you like those. I can distribute those at the, at the end here. Um, but that some of the things we're asking for, how they're going to meet, how they will they meet the teacher qualifications and compliance with the high quality pre-kindergarten program requirements, how they will have family engagement activities and compliance with the high quality pre-kindergarten program requirements. There's also questions about um, play areas and uh, nutrition, um, as well as implementation of the CISD curriculum aligned to the pre-kindergarten guidelines. Uh, how they will meet the 150 combined hours of teacher professional development and coaching hours over a five-year period. The circle progress monitoring, which must be submitted twice a year, so there has to be assessments given that are appropriate for that age and submitted to the state, as well as other applicable classroom standards and annual program evaluation. In addition, partners would also have to meet one of the following, and they are, uh, these are just basically credentials or things that would be accreditations for a program, such as Texas Rising Star Program, being a nationally accredited program, Texas School Ready Participant, or meet, most common, I would think, would be to meet the requirements of the Texas Education Code and, or be a Head Start provider. There's a lot of data that, are, that is reported to the state and uh, they would have to agree to participate in all those data uploads, and these are the kinds of things that we would um, have to submit um, for the program. We'll go through a lot of that. We, if you approve, we will begin submitting or receiving, pro or receiving proposals by uh, opening up an online application that will be on our district website beginning tomorrow. Um, they would be due by December 9th at 8 a.m., and we would evaluate those according to our criteria. And then if we um, feel like there's some that we might want to look at and, and discuss further, we would bring those uh, at the December board meeting. Um, we, any questions would be directed to Dr. Phillips via email. And that is really what our kind of our plan is to begin this process of seeking. And just because we seek doesn't mean that we necessarily have to approve or accept any. Uh, but certainly we do need to go through this process of looking and seeing what's out there and what our options are. Okay. See, that was my question. You can yeah. just solicit, but you don't necessarily have to select. Correct. Yeah. And I, I mean, looking at the criteria, you're asking someone to create a mini CISD for a term for the period of two years with all those qualifications and so forth uh, pertaining to, and, and then I'm going to yank all of them back and I'll take it in-house, right? It's very potential, yes, sir. <laughs> 
Has there been any consideration for, I, mean, I saw the word cluster there, okay? So more than one school's pre-K goes to one, yes, sir. one campus, okay? It, it seems to me that that would be a, you know, if you picked one of our schools that was centrally located in that, <coughs> in that feeder zone, if you will, and, and had the program there, <coughs> I, I realize you would have to push students out from where you know if they're going to that campus. It just seems like to me that 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 might be a solution, at least maybe in, in some of the places. It it is. It's one that we've talked about taking advantage of some room we have at Houston, some room we have at Hauser, and depending on what happens with our zoning in the Woodlands, it may that may happen there as well. Uh, we're waiting to see what that looks like, but but if we have a, a campus that suddenly has. Um, a lot of open seats, then we would certainly look at trying to do some clustering. And the biggest challenge, with, there's a lot of advantages, and our, our, our elementary team has been out to visit some pre-K centers in, in nearby districts, and there's certainly a lot of advantage to doing that and, 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 and aggregating a larger number of teachers to work as a group and, and to provide services. Uh, I think the biggest challenge for us is just the transportation logistics, that when we do that, you know, that is the biggest. Let me say it a different way. Maybe not if there's just a large number of seats. I'm talking about having a pre-K school. Like Correct. an early childhood center. You know, like where, whoever's going there now goes elsewhere if they're older. You yes, see sir. what I'm saying? Converting yes. one of our elementaries. Converting an elementary. Yes. Okay, I'm yes. sorry. I was, I was yes. just making sure. Yes. That, that, it seems like that. I, I do know that rezoning it. I, I know that there's pitfalls it, with it's, every decision. No, you're started shaking there. He's like, oh, no, <laughs> we've actually talked about it and we've even played with it a little bit. But you're right. I mean, that's it, really what it takes is to do that. We we certainly, if we had more seats available, I think it'd be easier to do. Uh, I think the hardest part is we're just tight right now, generally in the district. But uh, it's certainly an option. It's one to look towards. And, and we've we've actually played with some models of, you know, trying to take everybody and rezone them to other schools and. Uh, and then create a, a pre-K center. I'm sorry, Jimmy, and what's your, what, are you going to be leading us, or what? Uh, yes. All right, well, fantastic. Is this, a, is this an all or none, meaning all those kids that you just pointed out, if some facilities meet and want to do this, are we allowed to use some of them? Or Correct. Or is it an all or none? No, I, I think we have the ability to select the partners that, that would work best with us. And I'm, so there's a lot of factors that will go into it. And this would be our first time to do it, so I'm not going to sit here today and say, hey, we've got this figured out. We don't. Uh, but certainly it's a starting point, and I think there would be a lot of discussions and a lot of consideration and a lot of the factors that go into it. And obviously cost is going to be a big part of it. Um, it would have to make sense to us financially. Uh, it would have to, you know, it's one of those programs that um, it's, it may sound attractive, but when you read the fine print, you realize there's a lot of requirements and those requirements will take resources and time yeah. and money to produce. And so I think, you know, there are certainly some challenges, but uh, we don't know until we put it out there to see who might be interested and, and how it might work. Um, you know, it's for us, it's still students that qualify. So a lot of providers that might currently have customer base that don't qualify, um, those students still wouldn't be eligible under, under this process. So it's really about um, bringing in students that we would otherwise serve that would qualify for us. One more last question. Do you, do you um, foresee any reason why we wouldn't qualify for this waiver in January? The, the first year will be no problem. Okay. I mean, I think there's so many, many, most of the districts in the state are in very similar situations than we are. They, you know, like you said, we get a, a, a end of May law and expect to be ready to implement that in August. Would, is, would you dare say that there, most of the districts are in way worse position than we are? I mean, you know, we could make it happen. I mean, assuming the rules weren't exactly the way they are with portals and money and so on and so forth. We could make it happen. Most districts can't, absolutely can't. That's correct. I mean, the best case scenario is where you have a lot of room. And I think our, our biggest challenge is for us, we can make it happen. We just have to be able to bring in the classrooms to make it happen. And, and that is the, the reality of the, um, for our limitation. But, you know, the only thing that we certainly have the resources, uh, but what the, really the thing that we're most tied in is space. Uh -huh. is it, is it, it'll be mandatory in August of 22. So 
Every, it's mandatory now if we right. got a waiver. So if we have it right, right now, we have to apply for a waiver for this year, which, as I said, it's a low bar. Um, and then the question will be is whether we apply for the waiver. We will be applying a waiver for next year simply because we'll, we, in order to do this, we'll have to bring in portable classrooms. And maybe by December, we'll have the plan worked out uh, so we know we can do it all in-house. But even if we do it in-house, we still have to seek these proposals uh, because we will be adding classrooms in order to do that. So I just want to be upfront about that. Dr. Hines, I had a question about, so are these students, let's, let's I'm, I'm making an assumption, but assuming that we use some other public or private partnership, are those students Conroe ISD students? Or are those students public-private? What it's, I'm getting at is, do they follow our guidelines and our policies mm -hmm. as far as everything? Or, so are we gonna have to monitor that? Are we gonna have to have an administrator be responsible? I'm just trying to understand. We were trying to understand that a little yeah. bit too. Because uh, <laughs> that we, just seems it, like it, a yeah, I think the, I think the answer is somewhere in between. Uh -huh. To be honest with you, I think uh, you know we're still trying to figure it out, so I don't have all the answers. But I presume we're being but paid, and then we're turning around and we're getting paid, and we're paying them. We would be paying them, and they would be subcontracting for us, and so all those state requirements would be there. Because there are um, requirements. Because there are requirements, right. um, and that's really it. And so we would we would have to get assurances and make sure that they were meeting those requirements. Beyond that, I think there are some things that they would have to answer for themselves in terms of, uh, you know, do we want to be in their uh, customer service business? You know, I, I don't think we do. Right. Um, so I think there's a fine line in there, but I think the compliance issues we would be involved with because we would have to be able to submit the required reports and right. accounting as required for us to receive our funding. Right. Okay. So we're held accountable and don't have any control. That's what you're saying. <laughs> some control somewhere in between somewhere in between <laughs> yes somewhere in between okay uh, so do we need so we approval do, we're going to need a motion gentlemen yeah we're going to need approval to seek these Mr. president i move we approve all right the solicitation as presented thank you mr sanders second we have a second mr moore discussion discussion all in favor thank you thank you very much thank you dr Hahn. all right item um five D, yes. select architect for pre-construction and design services for multiple projects and delegate authority to the superintendent. All Dr. right, no. Dr. All right, good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Null. It's my pleasure to bring forward for your consideration and approval a selection of architects <clears throat> for pre-construction and design services for multiple projects and then to delegate the authority to Dr. Null to negotiate and execute the owner architect agreements. So if you recall, when we began the planning process for our now uh, approved 2019 bond referendum, uh, we approved a pool of design firms to be able to participate mm -hmm. uh, in the planning processes and the, ultimately the projects resulting from that, that planning effort. So that uh, <clears throat> we're asking tonight to assign uh, designers, architects from those pools to projects that resulted from the planning effort. Some of those are bond projects, some of them are general fund projects, some of them are capital projects, some of them are capital maintenance projects. I mean, so there's all kinds of funding sources mixed in here. The, the reason for grouping is it's a matter of governance and efficiency to assign designers to each of these projects so we can get started on the pre-construction services, which involve selecting the contractors, going through the schematic designs, visiting the campuses, going through the programs, doing all the things to develop a set of plans and specs we can advertise to the marketplace and ultimately bring you a GMP for individual projects. Now, this assignment is not a guarantee of future work. Uh, it is a, uh, sets us up so that we can negotiate each project individually with each designer so that they will ultimately be selected uh, not only for their qualifications, but with a negotiated uh, fair and reasonable price. So at this time, we're asking for your approval of these assignments. Uh, gentlemen. I move the motion. You have a motion. Mr. Hubert. Okay. All right, I got a second, uh, Mr. Kidd. Discussion? I have a question, Mr. Foster. Are you all right? So of the projects that are being submitted, we're not guarantee we're guaranteeing the, the pre-construction and architectural design tonight, right? Yes, sir. I mean, okay. so uh, And we you will... said it's not a guarantee. 
Could you restate that? I, I, Absolutely. So I, I was reading and I probably right. missed so, what you said. I apologize. That's all right. So we have developed a schedule of projects over the next five, uh, five years. Uh, I mean, so a project that's scheduled five years from now, we obviously won't contract today, but the assignment's being made today. So when we get to that project, then we will negotiate the final uh, design fee and begin the pre-construction services for that project. So we do have approximately 15 projects right now that we're looking to engage the design services now. So that would allow us to issue the contracts and purchase orders for those design services. If we put the brakes on a process at, during any, at any point, we can stop, we'll pay for the work done to that point, and we won't have to move forward because that's always our option with our contracts we've, we've negotiated. Uh, but we are engaging for projects uh, and we're trying to move those designs forward. So it's not a guarantee that we'll even build it. It's, we're just designing it and kind of finalizing costs as I understand it. Correct, and, and even if we were to stop construction, for example, we can complete the design and put the design in the can if sure. that's the most efficient process. Gotcha, thank you. Okay, I have a motion second. Any discussion, all in favor? All right, motion passes, thank you, uh, Mr. Foster. Item 5E, receive capital improvement updates, Mr. Foster. All right, this time I'd like to bring you up to speed on the capital improvements we have underway throughout the district. And I'm gonna start with Stockton Junior High, which is scheduled to open in August of 2020. I'm happy to report it is on schedule. We're approximately 75% done. So you can see from this view, we've been talking about the solar field over the last couple of months. So it is active. We've been collecting solar energy for approximately a month now. And as of this morning, when I pulled the data, we've generated a little over 169 megawatts of megawatt hours of power. So it is currently all going back to the grid. Uh, so over the next couple of weeks, we are engaging the permanent systems on the main building and we'll start using some of that power we're generating on ourselves. So we have been working with Entergy. So they owe us a uh, statement of revenue essentially. So what, we're, what they're buying from us because we're not using it. Uh, and it's a horribly complex calculation uh, <laughs> and they are working their way through it. Uh, but they have assured us they are seeing our power coming to them and, and we also have uh, measures on our side where we're watching it go out. Uh, so it's a really neat process and it's gonna be a process that's gonna be uh, available to our students when they, they can see the power production in and out uh, when the building opens. Cool. The good news here is you can see the other focus I've been talking about is closing the building in, bring it into a dry condition. So you'll see the masonry scaffold around the building is uh, moving and, and the, the brickwork is progressing uh, every day <coughs> the sun is shining for us. So this is a look at the front entry of the building. You can see the reflections in the glass that's going in. So we're reaching that dry condition very rapidly. And on the back side, you can see some of the secondary entrances coming together as well. And like I said, <clears throat> this, the project is on schedule and we're scheduled to open for students in August of 2020. Quick, quick question. Um, yes. And I probably, somebody probably asked this before, are we on the cutting edge as far as the solar and state of Texas? So I, I will say we're not the first school to have solar on our campus. North Texas is a little more proactive in that. Now, we are the largest by a very significant margin. So we are considered a commercial generator, uh, which is, far, to my knowledge, we're the only K-12 district in, in the state that is a commercial generator of uh, power. Uh, I know it is Entergy's first agreement with, a, with an entity like ours. I mean, so that's part of the working their way through the calculations process, but I, I believe from a uh, full usage standpoint, we are on the cutting edge. So in layman's terms, we're, we're power for the school, but also we're able to sell power. And Absolutely, if we're not using it, it is going to use to somebody that is paying for it. And I'm so glad that we're also trying to implement some educational opportunities yeah. for our students with this as well. Absolutely, I got to take uh, one of our project coordinators, Ms. Uh, Tancy Foster out to uh, Patterson Elementary a couple of weeks ago where she got to be interviewed by uh, fourth graders, which was very entertaining and, <laughs> and uh, uh, surprisingly complex. I mean, so the, the children are seeing what's going on and they are inquisitive and asking a lot of questions. So, and that's exactly what we wanted to do. Now I'm gonna take you to Conroe High School. Uh, where we're at the, the final stages of that project where we are working on the ground floor, the oldest part of the building. And you can see the finishes coming together now. This is one of the collaboration spaces looking down the hallways. And you're seeing a uh, classroom that's very near <coughs> its completion. So over the next few weeks, we'll be uh, cleaning up, putting the details on it and outfitting each of the classrooms with their uh, classroom technology. And then it'll be ready for students when they come back after the winter break. 
Do these classrooms have the smart walls like Grand Oaks does? Well, when you say the smart wall, we have a floor to ceiling, corner to corner marker board yes. that has okay. uh, our projection and interactive yeah. uh, okay. uh, capabilities uh, that our technology department is deploying uh, pretty much. Even when they don't have the big surface, they still de deploy the same technology. And that is our update. Thank you, Mr. Russell. Outstanding. All right, item six, business finance. Uh, 6 eight, consider war for RFP 1906-01. Right. Mr. Reeves. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> Glad to be back. Yeah. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Null. Tonight we're recommending that the Board of Trustees award RFP number 19-06-01 new and used vehicles and RFP number 19-09-02 police vehicle new and used supplement to the vendors listed on the attached tabulation for an estimated expenditure of 500,000. Requests for proposals pertaining to the purchase of new and used vehicles for the district were emailed to register vendors through our, our electronic e-bidding system and advertised two times in the courier. We had six responses. Unit pricing was requested for new vehicles and a catalog discount to quote used vehicles through October 2020. Proposals were evaluated by the CISD maintenance, transportation, technology, and police department and reviewed by the purchasing department. Funds for the purchase of the new vehicles are provided by the general fund. Best value offers are recommended, and at this time I recommend your approval. Gentlemen, I move they approve, uh, be approved as presented. Motion. Second. Second. Discussion? All in favor? I just have a comment. Go ahead, sir. Mr. Reeves, thank you so much. I read through, I kind of spent a lot of time going through the purchase orders mm -hmm. and who the vendors that uh, were in there. And thank you for including the community involvement of those vendors. Mm -hmm. It is extremely important that we help those that are helping us and those community partners out there that were awarded some of these uh, do a great job in helping our school district and I just want to say thank you for making sure that that was included as a part of the assessment process. Yep. Yeah, motion second, all in favor. Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Item um, 6B, consider award CSP 19-08-03. Tonight we're recommending that the Board of Trustees consider awarding CSP number 19-08-03 job order, job order contract program to the attached vendors for an estimated annual expenditure of $1 million. Competitive seal proposals pertaining to the district's job order contract program were released in conjunction with the Gordian Group, was approved by the board in, back in April of 2016 to assist us with this program. The proposal was emailed to register vendors through the district's electronic e-bidding system and also advertised two times in the courier. Vendors were asked to bid their adjustment factors based on the Gordian Group construction task catalog, which contains construction tasks with preset unit prices on various trade categories. All unit prices are based on local labor, material, and equipment prices and are for the direct cost of construction. Adjustment factor pricing will remain firm through November of 2020, renewing annually with four optional one-year terms through November of 2024. These proposals were evaluated by the Maintenance and Planning and Construction Department and reviewed by the Purchasing Department. Best value offers are recommended. Uh, funds are provided in the general fund, and at this time, I recommend your approval. Okay. Move approval of CSP 1908-03 as presented. Mr. Moore, um, can I a second? I'll second the motion. Mr. Huber. All right, gentlemen, discussion, all in favor? Motion passes, thank you. Item uh, 6C, consider award for RFP 19-09-03, a career technical education CTE. Go ahead, Mr. Reed. Once again, we're recommending that the Board of Trustees consider awarding RFP dash Number 19-09-03A, Career Technical Education, Materials, Supplies, and Equipment to the vendors listed on the attached tabulation for an estimated expenditure of 600000 Requests for proposals pertaining to Career Technical Education, Materials, Supplies, and Equipment were emailed to register vendors through our electronic e-bidding system and advertised twice in the courier. Vendors were, vendors were asked to offer percentage discount off-shelf or catalog prices. We had 75 vendors submit a response. Contracts will remain firm through November of 2020, automatically renewing for four additional one-year terms through November of 2024. These proposals were evaluated by the CIC Purchasing Department. At this time, I recommend your approval. So moved. We have a motion? Second. A second. Discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Thank All right, Mr. Reeves, item uh, 6D, consider adoption of resolution approving payment and retention stipend to right. qualified employees. All right, CFO, Mr. Mr. Here we Rice. go, Mr. Rice. 
All right, good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. It is my pleasure to recommend the Board of Trustees adopt the resolution approving a one-time payment of a $675 retention stipend <coughs> to qualifying employees. To ensure that it continues to retain employees that exceed the district's expectations, to boost job satisfaction and productivity, the board approved a one-time employee retention stipend with a total expenditure of $5 million as part of the 2019-2020 budget. To qualify for the one-time retention stipend, an employee must have been, been employed on or before September 17th, 2019, be classified as a full-time employee working at least as a 50% full-time equivalent and still be employed with the district as of January 21st, 2020 and expect to be employed through May 29th of 2020. Every employee meeting these requirements will receive the one-time $675 stipend uh, in their Feb February 14th, 2020 paycheck. Stipend amounts for employees who work less than 50%, <clears throat> work at least 50%, but less than 100% will receive the retention stipend equivalent to the percentage that they are employed. At this time, I recommend your approval. All right, gentlemen, you've uh, heard the request. Do I have a motion? I'll make the motion. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All right, Mr. Emmons, second. All in discussion? Question. Go ahead. So the 675, will will that be received all at one time? Will it be? That'll be one-time payment, yes, sir. One-time payment in? February 14th. February on their, 14th. On their February 14th check, yes, sir. Okay. All right. And that budget item was the placeholder for the five million that we received as a part of House Bill Three yeah. additional funding, correct? For teachers. Yeah. Let, let, me, let me just be clear. The, <coughs> the 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 raise that we have given our teachers already. This in play. It it exceeded what our requirements were in House Bill Three. Correct. So this is truly a retention stipend, one-time payment. Correct. Okay. All right. We have a motion second. Discussion is done. All in favor? All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate that. Merry Christmas. <laughs> exactly. It's a little late for Christmas. It'd be, be for Valentine's Day, though. Valentine's Day. They yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pay themselves back for yeah. Christmas. Valentine's Day. No, no excuses, Dr. Yeah. Yeah. Item 6 well E. I don't get it. <laughs> Consider award uh, RFQL 19 01 01 bond on the right service. Mr. Rice. Yes, tonight I'm recommending the Board of Trustees approve <coughs> RFQL 19-01-01 bond underwriters to the pool of 11 underwriters listed below to provide bond underwriting services for the district in future bond issuances. Requests for qualifications pertaining to the bond underwriting services were emailed through the electronic e-bidding system to registered firms. The RFQL was made available to the Texas bond community via the Municipal Advisory Council's website and also advertised twice in the Conroe Courier. Conroe ISD received 23 proposals in response to the RFQL. The request asked for information regarding each underwriting firm's capital, proposed expenses, marketing abilities, office locations, both nationally and locally, and their experience. Based on the responses received and recent market sales, the pool of 11 underwriters, underwriters is recommended for your approval. At this time, I recommend your approval. We have a motion. I'm sorry, gentlemen, can I have a motion? So All right, Mr. Emmons, so move second. second, Mr. Sure. All right, good deal. Mr. Husband second, Mr. Emmons first. All right, discussion. No discussion. Mr. President, I just want to make a statement that I am abstaining from the discussion and the vote because I have a uh, financial interest in one of the advisors. Okay, one abstention. Mr. Huber? I have an abstention as well for the same reason. Two abstentions. Okay, all in favor? All opposed? Abstentions? Thank you, motion passed. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Uh, I would ask that once we start, uh, I had a constituent actually ask me, I think I, I requested that information from you. Yes. Once we start to sell off those uh, bonds, whoever's underwriters, wherever they can potentially purchase those um, bonds, could we post that somewhere or another or communicate that to folks who are actually interested? Yeah, we can definitely. Okay. I committed to someone. I, I, well, yeah. She's actually she, selling some of those tonight. So. All right, good deal. <laughs> Um, all right, receive item 6F, receive final results of refund, refunding bonds series 2019. Mr. Rice. All right, I'm very excited to bring to you the results of our refunding bond series 2019. And we hit the market at a very good time and we were able to refund $73.9 million worth of bonds and achieve a savings of about $8.3 million or a present value savings percentage of 10.724%. And we're in a very favorable interest rate environment and refunding these bonds at the lower interest rate 
without extending the life of the bonds provide savings and additional <coughs> bonding capacity in our bond program. And that helps us maintain the current debt service tax rate of 26 cents. Uh, Mr. John Roebuck, the district's financial advisor, is here this evening. And uh, he is here to present the detailed results of our refunding along with a look at some of our past and our potential future refundings. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Rice. Oh. President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Noel. Um, I'm not sure what else to say. You say <laughs> anyway in the savings. But what, what Mr. Rice did say, and actually let me get this going so I can go through it here. We did uh, hit the market at the right time. We actually sold bonds with a bond buyer index was at all time low at a 2.59%. So we were able to maximize the savings for the refunding and uh, do, maximize, maximize this interest savings for each year of the six years we took savings. Mr. Robux, do you allow people to borrow your crystal ball? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will I'd tell like you, to borrow it. I, it's not me. It's, it's, it's y'all's reputation in the market, your credit rating, and also just it was good timing. We got lucky. Yeah. We got lucky. And I'll take that any day of the week. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll go through the results real quick. Although you do have the number, we did refund uh, four series of bonds. Like Mr. Rice said, 73.9 million in bonds. That an average rate of a 3.625, or excuse me, a 3.375, up to a 5% coupon. And at the final source of uses, we did sell 66,755,000 in bonds to refund the 73,945,000 in bonds. And the refunding bonds had an average rate of a 4.931%. We were able to lower that down to an all cost interest rate of a 1.489% which in turn generated that savings of over $8 million, $8,321,000, which is like Mr. Rice said, a 10.7% PV savings. So we hit the market at the right time and, and because of the district's high credit rating, we were able to generate a lot of savings for the district. The savings is spread out over a six year period, uh, showing that far right on this yellow column, about $1,386,000 a year which again, like Mr. Rice said, because of the savings, we generated some capacity for this new bond program. And as a result, we did not have this in the initial numbers, but with this, we can, we can basically carve out capacity and stay well within the tax rate constraints we told voters of no tax rate increase. Uh, we did close on this bond issue today, so really this page is irrelevant. Um, we are done. The monies have been deposited. Everything's been uh, defeased on the district's standpoint. So these bonds are no longer the responsibility of the district. And then to kind of do a summary and lead into the, the bond program, since 2016, the district's had four bond refunding programs that have generated more than $38 million in interest cost savings, which includes this one we just are talking about tonight. In identifying future bond programs, refunding bond programs, and going into this bond program, we looked at some call dates of bonds you have outstanding and the next available potential bond refunding is in October of 2020 where we can refund up to 199 million dollars in bonds conservative interest rates it would some cushion because I'm very conservative as you know I like to come in and exceed the expectations we are estimating about 27.5 million savings for the October 2020 bond issue now great if something happens in the market yeah, yeah. It, it can be completely different. $27 million over what time period? Like, how uh, long would that be spread right, over? I think day? it's over about a nine-year period. Nine-year period. Nine -year period. Right. So it's, again, created a lot of capacity, again, for new debt mm -hmm. to fill in those holes for the tax rate. And then in 2023, we have another refunding, about $126 uh, million. And we're estimating, again, very conservative, <coughs> a lot of cushion, because it's so far out, of about $10 million. So mm -hmm. Now, that could get changed, go up and down. Um, and again, we cannot do these earlier because of the Tax Act of 2017. Uh, we can only refund these 90 days on a tax exempt base 90 days before the call date. So that's why these are being shown October 2020, October 2023. But again, because of these opportunities, we do believe we can come well within the constraints we told the voters for the new bond program. Sure. So, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have on the refunding. Uh, Mr. Dietz, your bond counsel is here also. Um, he actually drafted the document we asked you to prove the next item, but uh, he helped with this doc uh, this presentation, actually this bond issue also. So. Thank you, Jim. We appreciate you, Mr. Thank outstanding you. Job. Absolutely. Always outstanding <clears throat> job. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Um, item 6G, consider the in an approval of an order authorizing the issuance, sale, and delivery of Conroe ISD School District Unlimited um, Tax School Building Bond Series 2020. 
right. That's right. Yes, tonight we're recommending that the Board of Trustees approve the order authorizing the issuance, sale, and delivery of Conroe Independent School District Unlimited Tax School Building Bond Series 2020, authorizing the Superintendent and Chief Financial Officer to approve the amount, the interest rate, price, <coughs> redemption provisions, and terms thereof, and certain other procedures and provisions related thereto, and containing other matters related thereto. The parameter order for the sale of the Conroe Independent School District Unlimited Tax School uh, Bond Series 2020 was uh, prepared by work and that's mr. Marcus Dietz who's here this evening he can answer any questions on the order we have the approximate new issue amount is hundred and twenty two point five million dollars and that comes from the 2019 bond referendum and this will leave approximately five hundred thirty one point oh seven million in authorized but unissued bonds would like to just uh, address some of the the tax rate concerns that that, that we had heard about our 26 cent uh, tax rate on our debt service side in addition to us being in a favorable interest rate environment, in addition to uh, our credit rating, and in addition um, you know, to the savings that the refunding had provided us, uh, you know, each year we, we pay off 50 to $60 million uh, worth of principal each year, and that, that provides us capacity within our bond program. And also we're seeing steady growth in our property valuation. And this growth is coming from new homes and new businesses, for the most part, coming online our, our, in our property values. And then also, uh, I think if she has the... We'll pull that back up. Yes. Yeah, this schedule just kind of shows that, you know, we will not sell all $653.7 million at one time. We're actually <laughs> selling this over a five-year period. As you can see, the first, the first payment that we're talking about, or the first sale we're talking about this evening is $122.5 million. Um, so, so it is sold over five years, not all, all at one time. Mm -hmm. And then just taking advantage of this interest rate environment we're in. I mean, we're very fortunate to be here, and, and we're excited to be able to you know, tell the taxpayers and, and, and hold it true that we're able to hold that 26 cent tax increase. I mean, 20 cent uh, tax rate. 20 cent. So, uh, as you can see with the schedule that, that you're looking at on the screen this evening, uh, this bond sale will provide funds for building a new elementary school in the Caney Creek feeder zone, uh, renovations and additions to Conroe High School, the Woodlands College Park High School, the Woodlands High School, Oak Ridge High School. York Junior High School, Runyon, Creighton, and Wilkerson Elementary will provide for safety and security projects, campus renovations, technology, and buses. And we will also begin the design phase for the new elementary school in the Conroe High School feeder, a junior high in the Caney Creek feeder zone, the Conroe ninth grade edition, and the South County CTE program at Oak Ridge High School. So a lot of projects in this first sale, and, and we're very excited to, to make this step. Mr. Rush, real, yes, sir. real quick. Um, Flex 20, so elementary at Caney Creek, elementary at Conroe High. I know it says elementary, but that's a flex school. That is K through six. K through K six. K through six. Mm -hmm. So fifth and sixth grade, I know that's still uh, a primary. Is that still considered an elementary? And the reason I'm asking that is because a lot of times when we say elementary, we're thinking K through six. But really, outside of CISD, a lot of people are thinking elementary is K through four. And so they look at that cost and say, well, it's, you know, you're spending so much more money than everybody else for elementary schools, and it's just not the case, right? So, and, and, and we build our elementary or, or, large, K, yes. or K6 a little larger than, than most school districts. Yeah, yeah and even got, if we, how we choose to use them, be it K6 or K4, it's the, the price is based on the capacity. So the reason that our buildings cost more than some other school districts might be because we build it. Those schools, they have a thousand, Mr. Foster, what is it? Thousand students. Our schools have a thousand. Students. Yes, and you know you'll see a lot of places that will build an elementary a capacity of six hundred. So we're building a thousand. Yeah. So when you scale it out, um, absolutely. But it it's roughly the same cost. Is there a cost difference when we go K six versus K four? Roughly the same. Roughly the same. Yes. But as you said, it's it's, it's capacity, capacity. Total it's capacity. capacity. I mean, it, I, I we have to look outside CISD and a, a traditional uh, an average school district in Texas their elementary schools don't have 600 kids their their district may have let me just tell you for example there's there's a there's a 2a district in, that I'm familiar with that just built a new high school for 15 million All right. okay a new high school yeah <laughs> okay now it's a metal building with some brick around the edges okay and trust me it's nowhere near our campuses but it doesn't have the useful life either mm -hmm. it doesn't have the ins same insurance rating okay it doesn't have a lot of things so everything is relative to what you're building right and 
and and there are reasons why we build things the way we build them and and when you compare to to peer districts we're still beating their per square footage cost by many dollars so, you know I, I don't have a specific but I've, I've seen I've asked too many times I'm, I'm convinced right. that we're getting the bang for the buck all right Joe. I agree all right, do we have a motion second? I we got a yeah, motion. Yeah, we, we, we still have, we have yeah. a presentation. Just oh, I'm a sorry. little. <laughs> <I'm> bad, <man. laughs> but, uh, yeah. you know, I, I would like to introduce, uh, you know, the, the team in addition to Mr. Roebuck and BOKF as being our financial advisor, uh, Marcus Dietz. He is with ORIC, and they are our bond counsel. And also, the underwriters that y'all had previously approved, we are uh, recommending five underwriters. Uh, for this uh, transaction, senior manager would be Citigroup, co-managers would be RBC Capital Markets, FHN Financial Capital Markets, Morgan Stanley, and Estrada Hinojosa um, as our underwriters. Now, at this time, I'd like to ask Mr. Roebuck to present the uh, schedule of the sale for you. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Oops, excuse me. Okay, well, I'm going to go through the, the bond buyer index, and this is not as pretty as the last one. We've actually seen an increase in rates since we sold the refunding bonds by about 20 basis points. So we're now at a 2.79% uh, as opposed to the low of a 2.59. We're still in a great environment. Just see in the green box there, we're yeah. over 1.5% below the historical average. So still a great interest rate environment. <clears throat> With the turn of the fiscal year, or calendar year in January, usually there's a kind of a a lot of capital in the market, so you'll see rates even come down probably a little lower also. So we'll, we'll kind of hit that at the right time also based on the schedule we're presenting tonight. Uh, as Mr. Rice uh, presented, we are looking to generate $122.5 million in proceeds uh, based on current market rates. If you look at this chart here, or the numbers here on this page, the far left, your current debt service requirements, which does include the effects of the refunding we just talked about plus the estimated principal and interest on the Series 2020 unlimited tax school building bonds and the far right to total debt requirements after the sale of the proposed bonds. And again, this will, will generate $122,500,000 in proceeds for the district. To accomplish this, uh, we've actually started the process. We have a draft preliminary official statement. We've submitted the permanent school fund guarantee so we can sell the bonds with a AAA rating. Uh, tonight, we're asking you to approve the perimeter order to allow us to move forward and sell these bonds uh, after the first of the year. Uh, we're tentatively planning to sell them the first week of January and then close uh, the first week of February, at which point the district <coughs> will see the funds. But we'll go through and have a rating call, diligence call, the underwriters. We'll have a good document well in advance of the holidays for investors to have time to look at the documents and, and the financial information of the district. And then again, like I said, sell the first week of January. Uh, assuming market conditions are, are, are good for us. Uh, with that, I'll be happy to answer your questions about the timing and the schedule and the, the debt service requirements. And uh, Mr. Dietz, we'll be happy to talk to you about uh, the legal uh, documents we're asking you to print tonight. Mr. Roebuck, I have a question about uh, rating. Yes, sir. So uh, I know you'll have your rating calls on the 9th, but do we anticipate any changes in our present rating? Uh, probably not right now. Okay. Uh, with, with all the effects of what came at Austin, um, they're hesitant to make any changes right now. Okay. We're in a very solid position, especially heading into a bond program. You know, you'd love to have rating companies reward you before you sell the bonds, right. but they'll reward you after you finish some bonds and you're not growing anymore. So we'll probably stay where we are, which again is just one notch below AAA. So it's, it's right. you're PSF rare. Right, we're 3A, three, yeah, three I exactly. guess, I, I get that. Exactly. But we're still double A. Double A plus, double A plus. one. Okay. So you're right. one notch below AAA. So right. you're, again, great. Great. Okay. Position. All right. Thank you. All right. I have a motion. So moved. Motion. Second. Discussion. All right. All in favor? Outstanding. Thank, Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate you. Good job. Get him. Mr. Rice, item six uh, H. We're Receive actually going to change it up on you a little bit. Uh, all right. Karen Garza is going to present all our right. financial reports for us tonight. I know that you, Darren, often introduces Karen. Um, she is one of our business managers. She does a wonderful job in, in helping Darren, so she's going to make this presentation tonight. Welcome. I almost counseled it if Darren was going to get up there, but now I'm excited. Go ahead. <laughs> Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. It is my pleasure this evening to present the financial statements for the month ended October 31st, 2019. The first statement we'll look at this evening is the balance sheet for the general fund, the debt service fund, child nutrition fund, and self-funded insurance. 
The balance sheet shows the district's assets, liabilities, and fund balances. Of course, one of our largest assets on the balance sheet is our cash and investments. In the general fund, we have $14,100 cash on hand. Bank deposits of $7.2 million. Our investments in the state pools of $92.8 million. Our investments with Wood Forest National Bank, $75.7 million. And our longer-term investments with TCG Investment Advisors of $51.6 million. For total cash and investments in the general fund of $227.2 million. The next statement we'll look at this evening is the income statement. The income statement shows the district's revenues and expenditures. Our revenues come from three major sources. First, local and intermediate sources in the general fund and debt service fund are generated primarily from property tax revenue. In the food service fund, food sales, and in self-funded insurance, premium contributions. Our state program revenues is our second source. We have received our first two payments from the state in the amount of $116.4 million. And then our third source is our federal program revenues of $193,000 for total revenues of $118.5 million. If we look at expenditures by major object, in the general fund, of course, you can see our major expense is payroll in child nutrition, food and supplies, and then in self-funded insurance claims. We're two months into the new plan year. Um, Self-funded insurance, total revenue of $8.1 million, total expense of $6.9 million for a net revenue over expense of $1.2 million. Our participation at the wellness centers continues to be strong, averaging 576 year to date. Our investments as of October 31st, 2019, par value of our portfolio is $334.5 million. Our pools are yielding 2.063. Our investments with Wood Forest National Bank are yielding 2.11. Our longer term investments with TCG Investment Advisors have a WAM of 421 days, yielding 2.082%. And our combined portfolio is yielding 2.078% with a WAM of 62 days. And our benchmark, the 90 day T bill, is, is yielding 1.525. Ms. Cars, I have a couple questions. Can't let you get away without it. <laughs> <laughs> so I know we just talked about our bonded indebtedness. When is our next bond payment due? In February. February 15th. Yes. I know we make those twice a year, right? February and August. February and August. Okay. All right. So the next one's February. All right. That's really all I had. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions? Outstanding job. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. All right. Uh, item seven, executive session. A closed session of the board will now be held on matters contained in the notice uh, for this meeting as authorized by section 551-071, 551.072, and 551.074 of the Texas Open Meetings Act. Should the board determine that any final action, final decision, or final vote be required with regards to any matter considered in such closed or executive session or meeting or session, then such final action, final decision, or final vote shall be had shall be at either uh, the pub a the public meeting upon the reconvening of the public meeting or b at a subsequent meeting of the board upon notice thereof as the board shall determine a closed session of the board will now be held the time now is 9 36 p.m the board is now open in open session at tomorrow no uh, at 11:19. Uh, 11 19. 19, man. A.M. I think Ray fell asleep. I think this is this is what we call it work double overtime. I go wake Ray up. I think he, we left him in the conference. Right, he's the restroom. He's restroom. Yeah. Be rich. All right. Ready for item nine, Mr. President? I, oh yes, yes, sir. Item nine, item nine, legal. Consider resolution to cast votes and cast votes for any election 2020, 2021 Montgomery County Appraisal District Board of Directors. Thank you, sir. Uh, We're going to talk about it. I, I think we should wait for Ray to like, yeah, that's fine. allow him to. Well, that's what you think. Yeah. That's not necessarily what we think. <laughs> we enough. operate as a team of seven, so you outvote it. <laughs> We're giving. I'm just kidding, Steve. We're giving. If I said team of seven, I'm sorry, Doc. No, I didn't mean to leave you out. Just the vote. Okay, send me an invoice on that one. I'm not a voting member. I understand. That's what I'm saying. If I said team of seven, I just meant for the vote. I respect that. 
There he is. Ray. It's all right. All right. Mr. Sanders, we are considering resolution to cast votes and cast votes in election 2020. One item nine. Mrs. Gladys, if you would. Got you now. Okay, so you, you know, we do this it seems like every time you turn around. So we have 1,742 votes for you to ask that. for one or more candidates for the boards. We are early in the process. The ballots are, you know, the voting doesn't have to be complete till December 15th. So very few entities have cast their votes, but I'm going to share with you what they have. And I think that the board is really pretty much already set if you vote for the candidates that you nominated. So Peggy Housen was the nominee of the MUDs. The MUDs have 702 or so, uh, 706 votes. They have all cast all of their votes for Ms. Houseman already. Um, the county, she was also the county's nominee. They have not cast their votes yet, but the county has um, 959 votes. So I mean, I'm, I think there's an assumption that they'll cast their votes for their sole nominee, Ms. Houseman. Um, Magnolia ISD uh, nominated Adam or, uh, Simmons and cast all of their votes for him. And the appraisal district thinks that he's already in regardless, of, and they're assuming that you guys are gonna vote for your nominees and split your votes. How many does Magnolia have? Magnolia has 350, 29, 329. That's not enough votes to guarantee it's them. It's not, but I think the way they're calculating it, I was, I'm not, Math person, um, but when you add up the votes, you know when you take our votes out, if they're you're going to vote for yours, and the votes that have already been cast, assuming the people vote for the, who they nominated, that thing can be three twenty nine for him. And his name is Adam who? Simmons. Um, okay, and, and tell me again who we nominated? We nominated the ones we nominated last time: Bruce Tuff, uh, uh, Bonar Luzi, and um, Lynn. Yes, very blind. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And how many total votes do we have? 1742. Yeah, and you can do 581 twice and 581. Does anyone want to make any um, I'm changes? I'm making a motion. <coughs> what, what? Is it 580 and 580 and 581? We have okay. a motion. I move. Other I'm, 581 twice. We have a motion. 581 twice. We have a motion. How many, second, how many right? positions? Second. He's yes, going to make his motion, though. Go ahead. Well, There's five. I need votes. to make the motion. Okay. So Peggy's going to have one of them. Oh, I said, y'all might disagree with me. Well, Magnolia's got discussion. the one. So, okay. so we're doing the motion right now? Yeah. John's doing a motion. John's going to motion, but we'll have discussion in case anyone wants well, to change that. So I move, I move that we give uh, uh, Tuff and, uh, how, do you, how do you say it? L Luzi. Luzi. Uh, 581 and Barry Blanton 580. That's my motion. I'll second that. Okay, now a discussion. Mr. Sanders? No, no, no. I'm just, at, I'm just doing the math real quick. <laughs> Uh, he is a math guy. Well, I'm going to wait until you finish, <laughs> brother. I'm not a math elite, though. I'm not that smart. Uh, so those are the five candidates, as I understand it. Well, or there's there others. Well, there are more candidates than that. But, but so far, there's been no votes cast for those. <laughs> vote for Mr. Just one vote. Uh -huh, Mr. Hancock. Okay. All right. Okay. So now I see where you're going. No, I have no problem with that at all. Okay. I, think, I think from what I'm seeing that... Uh, it's There's just no Miss Gladys. Yeah, the math is not going to work out for anybody else, but it, that'll okay. get those three. All right, so we have a motion and second. Everybody can, I mean, we just had all the discussion, I assume. All in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Thank no, you. No, oh, 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 oh. Did you? I'm going to abstain. No. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to abstain my vote. That's that's my way of of uh, kicking against the. I, I'm, I am not of the opinion that, I know this is how it works, but I'm not of the opinion that. that a taxing entity should be voting for the uh, the CAD. Okay. So that's just that's just my opinion. Sure. So respectfully, I'm. So I'm we got a motion. We have um, we have six four. No opposition. One abstention. There you go. Got gotcha, you, man. Mm -hmm. I signed Wait, this one just for the vice president. Opposition. Abstention. That's All right. Uh, can I get a motion to close? Oh, Dismiss. Got a motion. Motion carries. Eleven twenty four.